Good evening and welcome back to the second part of the committee's 20th meeting in 2019, which is turning in to be quite a marathon session. Could I ask, please, people to make sure that your mobile phones are on silent? Um, with, this evening, we're continuing with agenda item two, which is the consideration of stage two amendments on the Transport Scotland Bill. I welcome back the Cabinet Secretary for Transport Infrastructure Connectivity and his supporting uh, officials. And there are lots of non-committee members present, and I, and I welcome you all, without naming you all, to, to the meeting this evening. Um, and we will now move on, straight on, to the uh, First Amendment, and I call Amendment 110 in the name of Colin Smith in a group on its own. Colin Smith, to move and speak to Amendment 110, please. Thank you, Convener. I'm happy to move Amendment uh, 110 in my name, which requires the Government to regulate to create a quality assurance framework for bus operators. This is one of the issues that emerged in the evidence to the Committee, and indeed our Stage 1 report called for the Government to look at this on the basis it would help raise standards and drive improvement in the passenger experience. A number of stakeholders raised concerns that this bill does very little to address the challenges around patronage. However, a robust national quality assurance framework to drive up standards could make a real difference to bus usage. A nationally consistent approach to quality assurance will help to identify and address issues within the sector, be it problems with a particular area, operator or aspect of the service. This amendment calls for this framework to be set out in regulations following consultation. Well, ScotRail's responsibilities in this regard are set out on a contractual basis rather than a legislative one. Taking that, that approach with buses would create an inconsistent national picture and will fail to capture <coughs> commercial services. I believe regulations are therefore more robust, whilst being relatively easy to update as needed. Thank you, Thank you Colin. Uh, Jamie Green. Um, can Mr Smith, perhaps in summing up, uh, explain how the national quality assurance framework differs from the franchise framework and whether there will be separate or intertwined targets or replication of the targets therein? Yes, I'm sure we can. No one else indicated they wish to speak. Cabinet Secretary. Convener Colin Smith's Amendment 110 seeks to place a duty on Scottish Ministers to establish a national bus quality assurance framework and to set out how that framework will help improve local services and the experience of users of those services. The fundamental aim of the options presented in this bill, particularly BSIPs and franchising, is to improve the quality of bus services in Scotland. The intention is that they will meet that aim through joint working between local transport authorities and bus operators, and taking account of the different interventions required to meet different local needs. This is considered to be the most effective approach in the deregulated bus market. There are provisions for monitoring performance of BSIPs and any franchising arrangements that local transport authorities can decide to put in place. Scotland-wide measures are already in place through the Scottish Government-funded Bus Users Scotland to monitor compliance by bus operators with existing legislation, legislative requirements to check bus services are running where and when they should be and work with bus operators to act on complaints and share best practice. Further, the, Transport, the Traffic Commissioner has powers to investigate complaints and impose sanctions on operators who fail to run the registered services in accordance with any required standards. As such, while I completely share the aim of improving the standard of bus services in Scotland, I do not consider that establishing a national quality assurance framework for operators of local services would be an effective or appropriate means of improving the standards of those services. And I would ask Colin Smith not to press Amendment 110, but if he does press it, I would ask the committee to reject it. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Colin Smith, can you wind up and press or withdraw your amendment? Thank you. In terms of the two substantive points raised, um, Jamie Green asked about how a national framework would differ from um, any um, guidance within BSIPs or franchises. National framework would cover all services, um, commercial services, um, as well as all those covered by franchise and BSIPs. Um, the BSIPs and franchise framework would only cover those that are within the franchise or a BSIP, and at this moment in time we have no idea whether or not there will be any franchises, never mind how many services they will cover. So in the absence of a franchise, at least we have a national uh, framework here. Uh, with regards to um, 
the point the Cabinet Secretary made that there are existing provisions. I think we all know that the existing provisions simply do not go far enough. Indeed, that was the view of the Committee uh, in our Stage 1 report when we asked the, the, the Cabinet Secretary and Government to look at this particular uh, matter. Um, the, the Cabinet Secretary made the point that you can complain to the uh, Transport Commissioner if a standard is not met. Well, the reality is, if the standard does not exist, there is nothing to complain about. And what this amendment does today is to look to bring forward a national framework to drive up standards uh, across the sector. Uh, Colin, could you just confirm, please, are you pressing or withdrawing yeah, your I'll amendment? press my amendment. Okay. Um, thank you for that. The question is, amendment 110 be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We're not. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Abstentions? Thank you. There are two votes for. There are eight votes against. There is one abstention, and therefore Amendment 110 is not agreed. I call Amendment 248 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 230. Uh, could you indicate, uh, Colin, whether that is to be moved or not moved? I am happy to move Amendment 248. Okay. Uh, I therefore call Amendment 248A in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 230. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 248 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Sorry, 248A be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hand. Sorry, I'm Sorry. Uh, sorry, I've got it completely out of myself. The clerks are entirely right. Sorry. I'm going to, let, let, let me start that again. Just, I, I apologise. We have 248 has been moved, and I'm called Amendment 248A in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 230, and Jamie Green has moved it. So the question B is that Amendment 248A be agreed. What page have I missed? <laughs> sorry, sorry, you're right, you're right, sorry. sorry I, 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 I am correct, right. I think. So let me, let me try that again. The question is that Amendment 248A be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Therefore, there are three votes for. There are eight votes against. Therefore, Amendment 248A is not agreed. So, uh, Neil, uh, sorry, Colin, could you just push Amendment 248? Uh, I'll place Amendment 248, yeah. Okay, the question is that Amendment 248 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Thank you. There are two votes for. There are nine votes against. Therefore, Amendment 248 is not agreed. I call Amendment 249 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 230. Colin Smith, is he moving at all? Not, not moved. Not moved. Therefore, I call Amendment 250 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 233. Colin Smith, to move or not move? Uh, not move. Ah, right. So we do. Well, we're not on that. 258. Why? Because there's no, there's no amendment okay. for Jimmy to amend. Okay. I therefore call Amendment 258 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 233. Uh, is that to be moved? Um, not moved. Not moved. Okay. The question, therefore, at this stage is that sections 35 and 36 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Right, we now move on to smart ticketing, functions and membership of the National Smart Ticketing Board. I'd like to call Amendment 111 in the name of Colin Smith, group with amendments as shown on the groupings. Colin Smith to move Amendment 111 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I'm happy to move Amendment 111 in my name, which adds a specific reference to the development of a national smart ticketing scheme to the Board's remit. 
Improving smart ticket and capabilities is critical to encouraging public transport use, and in particular, starting to halt the decline in bus patronage. And I, I welcome the decision to set up this board. However, what has been proposed here clearly falls far short of the government's previous plans for a single national multimodal smart card. And indeed, the Cabinet Secretary's response to this committee's stage one report appeared to confirm that such a card is no longer being developed. It is not enough in itself to just expand the use of smart card and contactless technology. We should still be working to deliver the joined up ticketing system that customers want, which would allow you to buy a single ticket for a journey run by multiple bus operators and indeed multiple modes of transport. I appreciate the significant technical challenges that exist in this regard, particularly around distributing fair revenue, but we should still be working towards national smart ticketing in the long term. Therefore, my amendment simply adds to the Board's remit to make clear that looking at this issue should be one of their aims. As things stand, based on the bill before us, you'd have difficulty really knowing what the actual aim of the advisory board is. The bill certainly does not offer any leadership or direction on that role and simply says we are setting up a smart ticketing board to look at smart ticketing, and that really does, I think, show a lack of ambition. Thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 112 and the other amendments in the group? Convener, amendments 111, 112, 251 and 238 relate to the functions and membership of the National Smart Ticketing Advisory Board. Dealing firstly with the Board's functions, I recognise that this committee's stage one report called for the Board's remit to be widened to include a responsibility to bring forward proposals for a single ticketing system to apply across all modes of public transport in Scotland. As outlined in the response to that report, the Scottish Government do not believe that the significant restructuring of the market and considerable cost to the public purse required to create a national scheme are justified, and as such, it would not be appropriate to give the Board such a responsibility. However, I do consider that the National Smart Ticketing Advisory Board is well placed to provide Scottish Ministers with advice and recommendations about the future strategic development of smart ticketing across Scotland. Amendment 111 and Government Amendment 112 both seek to address the strategic aspect of the Board's role. Amendment 111 from Colin Smith seeks to enable the Board to advise the Scottish Ministers on any proposal for the development of a national ticketing system. In my view, this would unduly constrain the scope of the Board's strategic role and the options it might wish to pursue in connection with future strategic development of smart ticketing, which may or may not include proposals for a national scheme. There are also a number of technical issues which mean that the legal effect of the amendment is unclear. For example, the amendment would tie this new aspect of the Board's role into their existing remit of providing advice in relation to the Scottish Minister's functions relating to smart ticketing arrangements. Scottish Ministers do not have any function relating to the development of proposals for a national smart ticketing scheme, and nothing in the Bill would enable the creation of such a scheme. By contrast, the Government Amendment 112 would give the Board a standalone function of providing advice and recommendations on the strategic development of smart ticketing in Scotland. This will ensure that the Board has the freedom to look at all options, national or otherwise, and to make recommendations as to how those options may be progressed. I therefore ask Colin Smith not to press Amendment 111, but if it is pressed, I would urge the Committee to reject it. Moving on to the Board's membership, this will be provided for by regulation made under new section 27C3 of the Transport Act 2001. Amendment 251 and 283 both seek to impose requirements in relation to regulations about membership. Amendment 251 from Colin Smith would require that those regulations make provision to ensure that membership of the Board includes representation of people who have disabilities arising from physical or mental impairment. Until those regulations are made, it is not clear what the process for appointing members of the Board will be or indeed what the composition of the Board should be. However, new section 227C4 of the 2001 Act obliges the Scottish Ministers to consult with certain categories of person before making these regulations. These issues will therefore be considered in detail with relevant stakeholders, including the, Mob the Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland, as part of that process. This will ensure that ministers are well informed as to how best ensure that people with a disability are appropriately represented on the board. 
It is also worth noting that in making such uh, regulations, Scottish ministers will be subject to the public sector equality duty set out in the Equality Act 2010. And for all of these reasons, I would ask Colin Smith to withdraw Amendment 225, but if it is pressed, I would ask the committee to reject it. Amendment 283 from Colin Smith would require that regulation-making provisions about the board ensure that the membership of the board is geographically diverse. I am confident that the consultation process which I have outlined will ensure that the membership of the board is well balanced and appropriately reflects the interest of passengers, operators and local transport authorities across Scotland. I would also mention that there are a number of technical issues with this amendment, which means that the legal effect may be unclear. For example, it is not clear what geographically diverse means or how it would be measured or demonstrated. For all these reasons, I would ask Colin Smith to withdraw Amendment 283, but if pressed, I would ask the committee to reject it. Amendment 113 corrects a minor technical error in new section 32A3 of the Transport Scotland Act 2001, adding the word national to the title of the board in this section. Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Now the members indicated they wish to speak. Colin, I think that you have further amendments that, that you would like to speak to. Can I ask you to do that in your winding up, which I now ask you to do, Thank and to press much. or withdraw your amendment, please? Thank you very much, Convener. In response to the Cabinet Secretary's point regarding Amendment 111, that it restricts um, the remit of the, um, the Board. I have difficulty understanding how it could restrict the remit, because it adds to the existing remit, so it is an additional responsibility. So uh, far from um, restricting the remit of the, um, the Board, it asks them simply to look at um, the additional um, remit that I add to it. So that is expanding the remit, not um, um, restricting it. Uh, in terms of Amendment 112 and the Cabinet Secretary's name, uh, um, which actually adds to the remit, I am happy to support it. Um, <coughs> because it does something similar to myself in terms of uh, an additional remit. Uh, amendments 251 and 283 in my name both refer to the membership of the Smart uh, Ticket and Advisory Board. A number of stakeholders made the point that this board must have regard for different accessibility needs, and indeed their Stage 1 report from this committee stated that, and I quote, membership of the National Smart Ticket and Advisory Board should consist of a broad representation from all stakeholder groups with particular attention paid to geographical spread and accessibility. I have sought to put this recommendation from the committee into practice. Amendment 283 calls for the regulations produced under subsection 3 to ensure that the board is geographically diverse. Uh, and Amendment 251 calls for the regulation to ensure disabled people are represented on the board. I strongly believe the board must be able to deliver for people with a range of needs, and the best way to ensure their work is to be inclusive through representation on the board as the committee recommended. I note what the Cabinet Secretary says about guidance being published around that. Um, I would be happy, having placed that on record, um, not to move um, 251 and 283 on that basis. Um, but I think the committee's um, view on this matter was, was very clear. Thank you, Colin. Um, so I'm just, can you confirm that you are moving Amendment 111? Yeah, I'm moving Amendment 111, yes. The question, therefore, is Amendment 111 be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Uh, there's a division. Those in favour, please raise your hands. Those against, please raise your hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore, Amendment 111 is not agreed. I call Amendment 112 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 111. Cabinet Secretary to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 112 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 251 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 111. Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, not moved. I therefore call Amendment 283 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 111. Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, not moved. The question therefore at this stage is that Section 37 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're now going to move on to st smart ticketing, contact less payment and top-up cards. I'm going to call Amendment 284 in the name of Jamie Green Group with Amendment 285. Jamie Green to move Amendment 284 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I move Amendment 284. Uh, so this is about smart ticketing, uh, specifically around contactless payments and top-up cards. Um, I'd like to refer members to our Stage 1 report. Uh, I appreciate this is a small section of the bill, but I think it's an important one. 
We did have a few evidence sessions on it. And in our summing up to the government, uh, we stated that we were concerned that the provisions in the bill uh, went some way to deliver some improvements, uh, but that these alone would not deliver the aspirations for ticketing arrangements and schemes that are shared by the stakeholders that we met. We also said that we were concerned that the provisions on ticketing arrangements in the bill lacked ambition, and we felt that an opportunity had been missed. And finally, we asked on the Scottish Government to show leadership in this area and bring forward proposals for the development of a single ticketing scheme to be inserted into the bill before it completes its parliamentary passage. Now, I appreciate we're at stage two, but um, in the absence of any uh, amendments from the government, uh, uh, we uh, took on board the committee's comments and tried to come up with uh, some uh, sensible amendments. So 284 and 285 address two issues, not exactly a single ticketing system. I appreciate the complexities of that, and that will require further work. But I think there are two things we could do uh, in the meantime. The first is on contactless payments. Uh, 284 uh, seeks to uh, uh, ask uh, ministers uh, that via regulation will make provisions that contactless payments are available as soon as, as is reasonably practical for Scotland for payment to entitlement to travel. Um, it then goes on in detail to define what contactless payment is. Will the member take an intervention? Uh, yes, happy to. Um, can I put two questions to, to the member? Uh, first is, can he identify any place in Scotland where it is not possible uh, to make a contactless payment uh, for, uh, for travel? And can I also ask whether he is envisaging that this must cover contactless payments uh, for, some, for sums of money uh, over uh, the limit that is imposed by banks, which is currently £30 for a transaction. I, I, I'm sorry, I, there was a few members speaking. I, the second question, would you mind repeating the essence of it? Um, banks impose a limit on a transaction that may be authorised by contactless means of £30. Is the member attempting uh, to, to, to encompass payments that are in excess of that value, or, or any other value the banks may set? Uh, very good questions, and it's unfortunate that the government didn't bring forward these amendments because those issues may have been covered. On the first question, I think there are many areas where you can't use contactless. There are many local bus services. I'm sure everyone around this table will have local bus services where you simply have to pay by cash only, nope. um, or you have to buy a ticket in advance. Okay. Um, I, could, I don't want to single out any particular companies because I think there are some services that can uh, provide contactless. There are many, many others who cannot. So the answer is yes, there are many areas in Scotland where you cannot uh, pay for buses using contactless payment. I would like to see more rollout of that. I think that's what the committee said to the government, and that's what my amendment to a uh, four seeks to do. Um, as I said, I think this would oblige ministers to bring forward provisions we to ensure that this. Uh, just one second. It would oblige ministers to bring forward provisions to ensure that this option is brought forward as soon as is reasonably practical, uh, practicable as the language is used in the bill. Um, happy to intervention. Um, really, just to uh, uh, assist Jamie Green, um, in this very city, um, you cannot use contactless payment on Lothian buses, which is rather a shame, uh, seeing as everyone says it's such a great service. Uh, however, in Glasgow, on first buses, you can. So in Edinburgh, you can't. But thank you for uh, confirming that. I think that demonstrates the issue. I mean, there are still many ScotRail services where you can't use contacts. I appreciate there is rollout, and they're making good work, but I'm not aware of every single barrier uh, being contactlessly enabled, or has, have they made a sufficient progress? Pardon? But ticket machines, yes. Uh, ticket machines, but not at the barrier. No, but it, no this is contactless payment. Right. You, pay the, you, pay, you pay at the ticket machine, not at the barrier. You okay, need ticket so to get through the barrier. Thank you for confirming. So I, I guess my point is that I, I'm asking the government to, to come forward with uh, pl their plans on this. Uh, Amendment 285 is slightly different. Um, it places duty on local authorities rather than on the minister, who may be pleased to hear. And this is about uh, top-up cards and the duty to uh, uh, consider a uh, feasibility for do so. One of the things that Lovian buses do do well is the rider card, uh, for example, which is basically a, a single card which is topped up monthly and allows travel can I, can I just ask you just to stop there? I, I am struggling. There are several conversations going on around this table, um, and I think it's polite to listen to what other people have got to say, and I would like to be able to hear what, 
what Jamie's got to say. So could we try and limit the conversations, please? Jamie, sorry to interrupt you. Could you please continue? Thank you, convener, and thanks for your intervention. Um, yes, the Amendment 285 is around uh, top-up cards. Um, and that uh, it says that each local transport authority must prepare and publish an assessment of the feasibility of introducing uh, top-up cards within their local authority area. It doesn't mandate them to introduce the system, but I would like them within 12 months of the passing of this bill uh, for them to come forward with their plans on whether it's, it's feasible or not. I said I don't think that's uh, overly onerous an ask. Uh, in, in the Stage 1 report, we asked the government to come forward uh, with proposals in the absence of any. I've tried to come up with some as best I can. Um, if the government is willing to commit to come forward with more tangible uh, 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 plans in the bill, as we asked, then uh, I'd be happy to look at those at Stage 3. Thanks. Thank you, Jamie. Mike Rumbles would like to speak. I just have a question on this one. <clears throat> I'm attracted by this uh, amendment. It seems very positive. Uh, I'm interested to hear what the Minister's response to it is. But um, what does, uh, perhaps in summing up, Jamie Green could tell me, what, in, in law, in, in law, because that's what we're making, what does reasonably practical actually mean? I'm not sure. OK, I, I'm sure you'll come to that, and you can come to that in mind. Another member has indicated they want to speak. Cabinet Secretary. Can we an amendment uh, 284 and 285 from Jamie Green seeks to insert new section 27D and 27E into the provisions about ticketing arrangements and schemes in part three of the bill. Amendment 284 would require that Scottish ministers through regulations make provision requiring that contactless payment options are available as soon as practical throughout Scotland as a means to pay for travel. This amendment appears to be concerned with payment methods rather than ticketing arrangements. That aside, I agree that it's important to give the travelling public options which make it easier to travel and which promote the use of our public transport network. Contactless payment options can play a part in that. However, contactless payment is not attractive or accessible to all sections of the travelling public, and it's important that it be seen as only one of a range of payment options available. It's also important to note that the rollout of contactless payment technology is already moving at considerable pace, driven by customer demand, and we are already seeing rapid growth in availability across all public transport modes. In particular, ScotRail and all major bus operators now accept contactless payment. Contactless payment methods can also already be used to buy tickets for many journeys in other public transport modes across Scotland. The Scottish Government is committed to supporting operators in making these payment methods available where there is demand. To support further contactless payment availability on buses, the Scottish Government, supported by the European Regional Development Fund, established a £1.1 million grant fund in November 2018 to provide financial assistance for the upgrade of equipment. All of this being so, I do not consider it is necessary or appropriate for the Scottish Government to seek to regulate provision of public transport services so as to compel operators to provide contactless payment options. I would add that, to the extent that it applies to passenger rail services, such, as, such a requirement may be found to relate to the regulation of passenger railway services, and it being a reserved matter would fall out with the, the legislative competence of the Parliament. For all these reasons, I would ask Jamie Green to withdraw Amendment 284, but if pressed, I would ask the committee to reject it. Amendment 285 from Jamie Green would require all local transport authorities to prepare and publish an assessment of the feasibility of introducing a travel card, which can be topped up automatically and used across all forms of public transport in their area. These amendments would require to be published no later than one year after the bill receives Royal Assent. It is unclear at this stage whether the travel card is viewed here as a type of payment arrangement or a ticketing arrangement. It is also unclear to which public transport service it would apply. In all events, it seems premature and disproportionate to seek to impose, by way of this bill, a requirement on all local transport authorities to conduct assessments of the kind in view before, uh, before there is uh, any evidence of a need or desire for such an arrangement in their area. 
This is especially so given that the nature of these assessments and the timescale within which they have to be completed mean that they could give rise to significant cost and resource implications for the authorities with whom there, can, there has been no consultation about this proposal. For all of these reasons, uh, my view is that the obligation that this amendment would impose on LTAs is not necessary or appropriate, and therefore I would ask Jamie Green not to press Amendment 285, but if pressed, I would urge the committee to reject it. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Jamie Green, can I ask you to wind up? And press or withdraw your amendment, please. Thank, thank you, Convener. And, and can I thank members for their, their comments and feedback? Um, I mean, the, these, these uh, amendments are, aren't meant to be uh, difficult. They're trying to be uh, helpful. I'm trying to respond to the concerns that we, were, that we heard as a committee by stakeholders at stage one, and I'm trying to put them on paper as, as best <laughs> we can uh, with the limited uh, assistance we get in drafting legislation. Um, in response to 285, the Minister's comments that you know, uh, that there may not be a need. Well, how will they know if there is no need or requirement in an area until they conduct some form of feasibility study? Now, if the minister thinks one year is too soon, that's a perfectly f fine view to take. It he'd be welcome to amend it at stage three to two years, three years, or uh, as he see sees fit, that gives them enough time to do that piece of work. But if we don't ask them to do the piece of work, it will never be done. Uh, and just assuming that there's no need for it or no want to do it, I don't think is good enough. Um, I want us to be ambitious uh, with this bill on smart ticketing, and this is perhaps one small step towards that. On the other amendment, in 284, around contact deployment, I don't think for a second that this amendment is outside the competence of the Parliament. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that the uh, legislation team would have flagged that issue to me when I was going through the wording of this, and, and, and I, I should thank them for their help in doing so. And addressing Mr Rumble's point, um, uh, the, the phrase as soon as is, I, I guess if you compare this to 285 where we put in a time frame to do this because it was in relation to a feasibility study and I think it's something you could put a tangible you know dead dead uh, dead stop on I think that uh, with regards to rolling out contactless payment that is something that could take some time and could take and uh, yes yeah, so I'll get to get to why I think these words are, are the right ones um, uh, again I did consult uh, on the best wording to use I don't think there's any right answer sometimes with this, because if you don't want to define a period, but you do want to be as soon as possible, you have to come up with some wording. This specific phrase is a commonly used phrase in, in contractual law. Um, I could refer the member to a uh, case study, Goldman Sachs v Videocon Global, for example, where there was a dispute over what the definition of um, as soon as reasonably practicable is. Um, and I could spend a lot of time going into that. Um, but it is a, it is a, a commonly used term. To, to mean as, as in legal terms as, as soon as is reasonably possible by, by the parties concerned. I, I don't know how we could change that and make it better, but I, I would like to see the premise of this on the bill and then with perhaps with the help of the minister and his team to get the, the wording right on the timescale. So if that's helpful, I, I'm happily to. I think uh, I'm inclined to support this amendment, but I am concerned about the reasonably practical stage. So I think if we do get it on stage two, I think if the minister did come back at stage three, with a specific time frame that he is comfortable with, that would be helpful. So on that, on that basis, I'm, I will be supporting this. Can I thank Mr Rumbles for his support? And I, I think that, that by, in other uh, amendments, as you've seen, I, I tend not to not move amendments if the minister's uncomfortable with, with it. I think with this one, there's ample opportunity between now and post-recess at stage three to get the wording right. Um, and, and I hope that other members of the committee will look favourably upon what I'm trying to achieve with these two amendments. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So I take it you are pressing Amendment 284. Uh, yes. 284. Okay. The question, therefore, is Amendment 284 be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 284 is not carried. I call Amendment 285 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 284. Jamie Green to move or not move? Move. The question, therefore, is Amendment 285 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There is, therefore, a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Those abstentions, please raise their hands. 
There are three votes for. There are seven votes against. There's one abstention. Therefore, Amendment 285 is not agreed. The question is that Section 38 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I therefore call Amendment 113 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 111. Cabinet Secretary to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 113 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I now move on to uh, smart ticketing the power of direction. I'd like to call Amendment 114 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and a group on its own. Cabinet Secretary, to speak and move Amendment 114. Convener, Amendment 114 reflects the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee's consideration of the Delegated Powers in the Bill. The DPLRC asked that Scottish Ministers to consider amending new Section 32A of the Transport Scotland Act 2001 to include an express requirement for Ministers to set out their reasoning in any decision they issue to local authorities under this section. I agree uh, that an open and transparent process will reassure, reassure all parties as to why uh, Scottish Ministers have issued such a direction. To this end, I have brought forward this amendment to make clear that where Scottish Ministers choose to exercise these powers in to direct a local transport authority to make or revise a smart ticketing system, they are required to set out their reasoning for doing so. And I move Amendment 114. Thank you. No other member is asked to uh, speak in this debate. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I assume that's your wind-up as well. Yeah. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 114 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question, therefore, is Section 39 be agreed. Yes. Are we agreed? Yes. We are. We're jumping the gun there, everyone, or I'm being too slow. The, section, the question is that Sections 40 and 41 be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes, yes. We are agreed. Therefore, we'll move on to travel concession schemes. And I'd like to call Amendment 216 in the name of Paulie McNeill, grouped with Amendment 286. Paulie McNeill, can you move Amendment 216 and speak to both amendments in the group? Thank you, Convener. I'm moving and speaking to Amendment 216 and the group. This amendment changes the Transport Act 1985 to ensure that travel concessions are available to children up to the age of 18 rather than 16, but it also gets rid of another section of the Act creating concessions, concessions for children up to the age of 18 in full-time education, as this subsection would be no longer necessary if passed. It, my amendment, I argue, is necessary because many 18-year-olds still live at home, many are in full-time education. Um, Many are studying and not earning even the minimum wage. Some, some are not earning at all. Um, and the minimum wage for 16 to 17 year olds is much lower. Um, and the research that I've done, depending on the geographical part of Scotland you want to look at, it could be anything up to 10% of a young person's weekly uh, pay um, is spent on travel. Uh, Glasgow are in 7% and Edinburgh and Bathgate are around 10%. In the first year of this Parliament, I set out to promote a Members' Bill on discounted transport for young people and, in particular, 16- and 17-year-olds. I believe it was an injustice turning a 16 and immediately paying full fares on all public transport was not exactly a, 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 the best way of celebrating um, arriving at age 16. In surveys I've done across schools in Glasgow, in particular, and you would expect 16 and 17 year olds to support this policy. But I did test it on older teenagers uh, who did feel that if they had got the benefit of it, then they would have seen the benefit. Uh, anecdot anecdotally, I should say to the committee that many young people told me that when they turned 16, obviously, um, they would probably try to pretend they were still 16 in order to still get the benefit of it. But anyway, that's anecdotally, I need no names. Um, yes, I would, yep. Um, can the member tell me, in dra drafting this amendment, whether she looked into the fact that I think it's possible for local authorities, especially for children who are still in, or young people who are in full-time education, but not at the nearest school, but maybe going on to the college, that they can give uh, grants towards their uh, transport? Well, I, I did consult extensively with Young Scott and local authorities. Um, that particular suggestion never came up, I would have to say. But I'll go on to say why I think um, it's needed um, as a, a national provision. Um, so that you will be aware of the concessionary scheme for young people. So it's an entitlement that includes 16 and 18-year-olds to a third up to the adult single on any registered birth service 
or one third of rail journeys, 50% discount on rail, uh, rail season tickets, and importantly, eligible island residents receive vouchers for four free vouchers a year. And it's important to remember that ferries are important and are included. It would be included in such an amendment. And the issue of rail, um, I think the discounts are actually quite poor. Um, 16 to 25 rail card uh, means you get a third off, um, but you have to travel after 10 a.m. and you have to spend more than 12 pounds. Um, you can apply this if you buy a weekly or a monthly ticket if you can afford to do that. So I really think it's time for deeper discounts. And I think that 16 and 17 year olds in particular um, are the ones that I'd like to focus on. Yes, I've taken intervention. Um, there are approximately, and it is an approximate figure, 100,000 uh, people between the ages of 16 and 18 in Scotland. My back of the envelope estimate says this is 40 million that we're being asked to authorise per annum. What's the member's figure? OK, I'll get to that, because obviously I actually thought the minister would get to that first, but you obviously beat him to that. Um, so I would emphasise to the committee that I've spent a year doing this work. I've consulted Young Scott extensively, um, and Michael Matheson's predecessor, I did have a discussion with Hamza Yusuf about it. Um, and uh, the figure in which the bills unit were prepared to accept when I submitted it, uh, I emphasise it hasn't gone forward, yeah, um, is 3.2 million a year because it's extending. Well, you've got to bear in mind, Mr Stevenson, that what I'm suggesting in this amendment is that the half fare is extended. So they're already paying something. All I'm suggesting is that they continue to pay the half fare up into the age they reach 18, of which they would pay the full fare. I point out that in 2007, the estimated costs uh, for the, the, the scheme that I just mentioned, it was 27 to 30 million. The latest figures show that that scheme is only at 1.6 million spend. So it's a considerable underspend in that budget. Now, obviously, I truly accept the Cabinet Secretary will say, well, I've spent it on other things. But in 2007, we were going to spend a lot more on discounted travel. Um, now, that there's maybe some issues about reimbursement or who's not claiming it. But clearly, in my mind, discounts are not that deep. And the government haven't spent uh, you know, anywhere near the intended to spend when uh, way back in 2007. I conclude, convener, by saying I think it should be a significant policy for this parliament to recognise the injustice of turning 18 and being charged full fares on buses, trains and ferries. Uh, I don't think it's a particularly expensive option, but I will obviously wait with the bated breath to hear what the minister has to say about it. If the amendment fails, I would be asking the minister to consider whether there might be some other way in which to give 16 and 17 year olds a better deal in public transport, perhaps at weekends might be a, a halfway compromise. But I certainly think it's time to recognise is there's an injustice here and this Parliament should fix it. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, I now call Rachel Hamilton to speak to Amendment 286 and the other amendments in the group. Uh, Rachel. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Um, firstly, may I say that this has been a long-standing uh, party policy for the Scottish Conservatives, and we argued that uh, the free bus scheme should be extended to community transport and obviously community buses are an essential part of rural Scotland especially for older people and often these are only the only direct links to health care as well as friends uh, family or recreation and that is why my amendment will ensure that the Scottish Government publishes a report setting out their assessment of the costs and benefits of extending the bus pass, as well as ensuring that they consult relevant stakeholders, certainly. Uh, in a previous uh, session of this Parliament, we did a, a report into community transport, and we asked community bus uh, organisations whether they would want this, and most of them said that they didn't want the kerfuffle of all the paraphernalia that was involved uh, with it. I wonder how many bus co uh, community transport organisations the members consulted and whether they've changed their minds on that. So I, I presume that uh, Maureen Watt is speaking about the uh, Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee, um, which obviously in the previous parliament um, uh, actually recommended um, that uh, the Scottish Government publishes um, a report setting out the assessment of the costs and the benefits of extending the bus passes. And in my own constituency, um, speaking to many 
community transport providers. It certainly is something uh, that would make community transport more accessible, uh, more flexible, and the whole point is to make it easier for the users to um, get across a rural constituency in particular. The uh, Transport Secretary uh, uh, in the previous Parliament did highlight that there could be logistical issues um, with such a rollout and obviously um, the implications of financial cost as well. However, this is absolutely the right time and the prime opportunity um, for Scottish ministers to uh, introduce the uh, possibility of such a measure. And I cannot um, highlight how important um, community transport is as a lifeline in many constituencies and people uh, will uh, sympathise with that in this room. So my amendment um, ensures that that can remain accessible for those who rely on the most and this amendment speaks for those people and I ask you to support and I move the amendment in my name. Uh, you'll get to move it uh, shortly. Um, John Finney's indicated he'd like to speak, followed by Peter Chapman. John. Yeah, thank you, Convener. I'd like to speak strongly in, in favour of both these amendments, which I, I have to say, I, um, some people seem to consider very ambitious. They're actually very modest amendments. We've declared a climate emergency. We need to absolutely change the profile of spending. And it is about spending priorities. So when people talk about uh, how much will it cost, well, how much does the existing uh, infrastructure that we have cost? And what contribution is it making to um, the, the climate emergency? So particularly with regard to the comments about the rural communities that Rachel Hampton made, that, that's certainly the, the, the case. And, and I think there, there are opportunities to expand travel. Um, Pauline McNeill's um, amendment clearly is, is very strongly evidenced. And um, I, I think we, we, we've previously heard, I think, in the committee that we need to encourage younger people to, to use public transport. It becomes habit forming. Uh, and um, certainly the arrangements, as I understand it, ap applied in East Lothian when Lothian buses took over. They purposely targeted that audience with the, 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 some of the facilities on the buses. We, we, we absolutely need to do that. We need to move to a situation where public transport is free, that uh, people smile at that. Um, but that's certainly the case in a number of areas there. And everything is about spending priorities. So um, strong support for both these. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Peter Chapman. Peter. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I take a, a different view entirely. I, I don't believe we can support Amendment 216 in the name of Polly McNeill, which aims to extend free bus travel for all 16 to 18-year-olds, regardless of them being in full-time education or not. And as I argued when Labour brought the idea of free bus travel up as part of business a few months ago, this would not only be extremely costly, but would not be used fairly across the country, as those in rural areas with less or no services would not get to use it. Yes? Yeah, it's just to be clear that um, my amendment wouldn't result in free transport. It would extend the life of the half fare that you pay till you reached 18. So it wouldn't, you would still be paying. You would just continue to pay the half fare. So it's not, not free. Well, I mean, I, I take the point, but it, it would still be a, a very costly thing to put in place. And I still argue that where the uh, services are very poor in rural areas, the the constituents in that area wouldn't get the, the good of it, not get the same use of it. And I, I do believe it would be considerably more than the 3.2 million that, uh, that has been uh, proposed by Paulie McNeill. So I, I, I can't support that. And in the... The other camp, I certainly do agree with Rachel Hamilton's amendment, as, as already explained. Thank you, Peter. Um, Cabinet Secretary, uh, would you, I'd like you to comment, please. Convener, Amendment 216 and 286 both seek to amend Section 93 of the Transport Act 1985, which enables local authorities to establish travel concessionary schemes for public passenger transport services in their area. Amendment 216 would alter the categories of persons eligible to receive a travel concession under a scheme by increasing the age limit from the eligible young people of, el of eligible young people from 16 to 18. Currently, 16 to 18 year olds are only eligible if they are in full-time education. 
It is clear that before any changes to the categories of eligibility are fixed on the face of the, were fixed on the face of the 1985 Act for local concessionary schemes that could be made, the costs and other impacts of such a change would require to be rigorously assessed and discussed with local authorities on whom the costs will fall, as well as the other relevant stakeholders. In addition, all 16- to 18-year-old residents in Scotland are eligible for discounts on buses, rail and ferry journeys under the Scottish Government's National Concessionary Travel Scheme for young people. As the Committee may be aware, the Scottish Government has committed to assessing the impact of extending the entitlement to travel concessions offered to 16- and 18-year-olds under the scheme to all under 26, year old, or under 26 years old. We have taken this forward at the request of the Scottish Youth Parliament. And for these reasons, I am of the view that the Amendment 216 is neither necessary nor appropriate. Turning to Amendment 286, which seeks to require the Scottish Ministers to prepare a report on their assessment of the costs and benefits of extending travel concession schemes made by local authorities under Section 93 of the 1985 Act to community transport services. I am strongly of the view that this is not something that is appropriate for the Scottish Government to be compelled to undertake. The costs and benefits relating to provisions of local schemes will rightly vary across the country and as a matter for each local authority. I can see no benefit in the Scottish Government carrying out such an assessment and reporting nationally on a purely local issue. In my view, the amendment would introduce unnecessary central government bureaucracy and do nothing to support community the community transport sector. That isn't to say that the Scottish Government does not have a role in supporting community transport. We continue to fund the Community Transport Association and support initiatives around driver training and the CTA sits on the Bus Stakeholders Group, which I chair. Through that forum and others, we are engaged in, with all stakeholders uh, around implementation matters relating to this bill. And I will continue to promote the benefits of community transport in those discussions. We must be clear, at convener, the requirements in both these amendments place the financial burden and the uh, plans for taking them forward entirely on local authorities. And I'm not aware of any engagement that's been undertaken with local authorities to consider them, undertake, them, them taking on these additional burdens. I'm happy to give way. Uh, just, just for the uh, avoidance of doubt, can the Minister point to me in Amendment 286 where it places the duty to fund the service if it goes ahead? Uh, I'm just keen to pinpoint that. I, I think what the amendment does is ask the Minister to come forward with an assessment of the costs and benefits of the extension of the scheme. Seems like a fair ask to me. Uh, but the amendment is relating to section 93 of the Transport Act 1985, which enables local authorities to establish travel concessionary schemes. It's not the national concessionary scheme, which is the responsibility of Scottish Ministers. It's entirely local schemes that it relates to, and it ties into the legislation that enables that uh, provision. So, I'm happy to give way. Thank you. Um, repeatedly, um, and, and I'm all for localism, Cabinet Secretary, but do you not see that there's a collective position that can be adopted in respect of 32 authorities? Just as we talk about the non-trunk road network, do you not see that, as Transport Secretary, you have a responsibility that extends across that? Well, I also think it's important we recognise the role local authorities have and the discretion they have in order to introduce schemes in their local area where they see that as being appropriate. But in dealing with these amendments that are before the committee here this evening, they relate to local authorities and local concessionary travel schemes, not a national concessionary travel scheme which is operated by Scottish ministers. That's why it's tied into Section 93 of the Transport Act 1985. That relates to local authorities, not national government. Yes. Do the Cabinet Secretary support a national uh, cost-benefit analysis uh, of expanding concessionary travel to apply to community transport? Maybe it's something we can bring forward at stage three. Well, as I've mentioned, in terms of uh, the work we're undertaking on the uh, concessionary travel scheme for under 26, we're undertaking that assessment at the very moment uh, in order to establish the costs uh, associated with that. The requests that have been made by uh, uh, Rachel uh, Hamilton in her particular amendment, it relates to us undertaking a report to consider these matters Beyond that, it serves no practical purpose uh, other than gathering information. 
uh, for national schemes, sorry, for local schemes at a national level, uh, which is already available at a local level uh, for local authorities. Uh, thank you. Uh, if, if it was possible to um, bring the amendment back in stage three with um, uh, some work between um, the Scottish Government as well that would actually then give the power to local authorities after that gathering of evidence and the cost and benefit analysis had been done, would that not be beneficial uh, for the whole process? If local authorities wish to do that, then they are free to do that. It doesn't need to be in this legislation in order for that to be undertaken. Local authorities can carry out that exercise right now if they choose to do so. The Scottish Government could uh, actually uh, conduct that, which would actually take the um, brunt from the uh, local authorities, and then the responsibility uh, could then be taken or, or left by the local authorities. I, I'm, not, I'm not clear about what you mean by that. For, for what purpose? Well, for, for a start, if we take it back to a, a simplistic uh, uh, process, um, the infrastructure and capital... I'm mindful yes, okay. of a conversation across the, the, okay, the, the committee table here when actually it should be... If, if we, if we're very happy to do an intervention. I think the, the Cabinet Secretary, you've been asked specifically if it was brought back at stage three amended to take into account whether the Scottish Government would, would consider that. And I'm just sort of asking you to answer that, because that may clarify whether we can move on from this. I, I don't see how it could be changed with this amendment, uh, as it stands at the present moment, because these are local schemes that are operated by local authorities. Uh, Scottish Government at a national level undertaking an assessment and cost-benefit analysis of them uh, would serve no additional purpose. Uh, over and above what they can do at the present moment. So I, I, I'm not clear as to what benefit would actually come from and what purpose such an analysis would be for. On, on that note, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to, to press on? Because I think that's closest as a no you're going to get, uh, Rachel. Sorry. Can you therefore, uh, to conclude, I would ask Paul McNeill not to press Amendment 216, but if pressed, I would urge a committee to reject it. And I'd also ask Rachel Hamilton not to press Amendment 286, but if pressed, I would urge the committee to reject it. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Paul uh, McNeill, could I ask you to wind up and press or, or withdraw your amendment, please? Um, thank you very much. Uh, I don't accept the Minister's interpretation of my amendment. It, it already refers to a national scheme, and in any case, if he was concerned about that, it is perfectly possible to reimburse local authorities as they currently reimburse for the national scheme. That is how it operates. Um, it doesn't really seem to have addressed the question that I am trying to pose, which is uh, the half fares for 16- and 17-year-olds. I've, I've actually worked quite hard on these figures. I stand by my 3.2 million. I would accept the door 2017 figures. I uh, also stand by the figure that the, in 2007 the government intended to spend 27 million, and you're only spending under two million pounds on this concessionary scheme. So that alone tells you that the discounts referred to are not deep. Uh, they certainly need reform. But in this case, I will be pressing this amendment, convener. I think we're talking about extending half fares to full fares. This can be accommodated by a national scheme. If the issue is local authorities have to pay, it's perfectly covered by reimbursement of the government. That's their job. Thank you. Pauline. The question, therefore, is Amendment 216 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are nine votes against, therefore Amendment 216 is not agreed. I therefore call Amendment 286 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 216. Rachel Hamilton, to move or not move? Moved. I therefore, the question is that Amendment 286 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are six votes for, there are five votes against, therefore Amendment 286 is agreed. Now, uh, there is going to be a slight change of um, uh, people to assist the Cabinet Secretary. 
Um, while we're doing that, we are going to be moving on to another section, and this section has a lot of amendments in it. And the temptation, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the temptation is for everyone to speak to every single amendment. And if that indeed happens, we may be still here after recess. So I would ask you to, to, to be as, as clear and concise as possible. And now that we are all in place, uh, we're going to move on to the pavement parking orders and the extent of pavement parking prohibition. And I want to call Amendment 115 in the name of Graham Simpson, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I would point out that if Amendment uh, 116 is agreed, I cannot call Amendments 287, 288, 289, 290 and 291. Uh, Graham Simpson, please can I ask you to move Amendment 115 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Uh, thanks. thanks very much, Convener. Um, so I'll press uh, Amendment 115. Um, I've got 13 amendments in this very large group. Uh, but as you know, Convener, I'm a very succinct man. I do not intend to speak to every single one of them. Um, and if uh, Mr. Lyle could stop sniggering, we could get 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 on with things, because um, I'm aware that uh, you know you're in, you're in here for the long haul. Um, when I was uh, thinking about uh, the proposals to uh, ban pavement parking uh, in this bill, um, I was thinking, well, how's it, well, what's, what's the effect of this going to be if we have this blanket ban? Um, particularly if that blanket ban is en enforced. And that's the key thing. And clearly, the, clearly the answer is that cars will be forced uh, off the pavements and onto the roads. Convener, I'm uh, aware of something going on? No, it's just papers being circulated. You don't need it. It's not for this amendment. No, OK. Right, I'll carry on. So, um, I think when you've got, you get cars for on, off the pavements, onto the road, uh, and in many streets in Scotland, um, many residential streets in particular, I think that's a recipe for chaos. Um, streets are just going to be clogged up. You're not going to be able to move. Now, clearly the bill says, well, councils can uh, apply for exemptions. So I think what will happen is you'll get lots of uh, campaigns springing up all over Scotland, um, asking councillors to exempt their streets. Um, I, I think that's just the reality. That will happen. Councillors will be put under uh, extreme pressure uh, to have their streets or their areas exempted. However, it's a serious issue. Um, that's why it's in the bill. So I thought, is there a better, is there a better way uh, of achieving what, what we actually want to achieve? And so the idea behind uh, Amendment 115, and every, all my other amendments flow from that, is that you would give councils the power where they, where they see a need to, to introduce uh, pavement, pavement parking orders. So they, they would identify the areas where there's an issue and they would introduce uh, a pavement parking order. So pavement parking orders, uh, pavement parking would be banned in those particular areas. So it's really, it's flipping what is a good idea on its head and it's uh, making it more, more of a local decision rather than a blanket nationwide issue. But because I was uh, I'm thinking about where I live, uh, which is uh, East Kilbride. Um, East Kilbride was not built uh, with the motor car in mind, or certainly not the number of motor cars that we've got now. Uh, many of the streets cannot cope with the number of cars that are in them already. Um, if those cars are forced off pavements onto roads, the, the town will just snarl up. So I, I think um, South Lanarkshire Council would be loath to uh, introduce these uh, orders in, in most parts of that town. So that's the basic idea. 
Um, 116, uh, Amendment 116 merely flows from that, um, says what uh, these pavement parking orders should do. Uh, Jamie Green's Amendment 116A um, adds to 116. Um, and as I say, the rest are merely technical. Um, the other amendments are the, in the group, I think, are from Mr. Ruskell, and he can justify them himself. Thank you. Thank you. I therefore call on Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 116A and the other amendments in the group. Thanks, Camino. Um I, I'll start with um, Graham Simpson's amendments. Um, I did have a conversation with Graham very early on uh, about this issue, and I think I, 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 my approach to this was twofold. One is I had reservations uh, about the blanket nature of this, so it's a nationwide ban, and then we're trying to seek exemptions and exceptions, and exemptions being permanent streets that are exempt from the rule, and there's a lot of discussion, and we'll get to that, around what is exempt and how, and the process that you have to go through to, to do that. And then there's the, the issue around exceptions to the rule, which I think are the more short-term uh, uh, ways in which the prohibition does not apply and the circumstances around that. And again, we'll have, a, no doubt, a healthy debate around those prohibitions. Um, but on the issue of double pavement parking, I think from day one, one of the things I noticed is we were talking a lot about it in committee and a lot about it in the parliament, but not a lot of people outside of here were talking about it. And when you did start to talk to them about it, you got a lot of, uh, I think, quite cautious feedback about this, that yes, there is an issue that we need to address. I think, helpfully, there's a collective cross-party uh, consensus that we need to address the issue of inconsiderate parking. There are many ways we could do this. The bill proposes one way, and I think Mr Simpson, in earnest, proposes a different way, and that's to make it easier for local authorities to address problems where there are problems, but not create problems. Because in effect, I still have reservations, and I think some of my later amendments uh, on this part of the bill will, will try and address some of those around the issue of if you simply uh, create a prohibition and move all the cars onto the road, it will cause absolute chaos in so many local authority areas. Um, I've, now, since we've started doing this, I drive around and look at streets where there's pavement parking. Look at how much pavement is next to it, look at the circumstances and the reasons why those cars are on the pavement. I think a small, very small percentage of them are being inconsiderate because they're lazy or they don't want to park anywhere else. I think the majority of them are doing it because they feel it's the right thing to do or they haven't got any choice because there's nowhere else to park. And I think we do need to have a serious consideration to these amendments. Um, it is a different approach. It does flip it on its head. But I think we do need to be realistic about the cause and effect and the consequence of what we might pass if this uh, blanket approach goes through. So I'm willing to support um, the amendments in Graham's... Uh, yes, in a second. I'm willing to support the amendments in Graham's name on the premise that I, I like the approach. And I think the pavement parking order is a sensible uh, uh, approach to this. Um, it may not get a majority support of the committee, and in doing so, therefore, I've taken a parallel approach to try and accept that if there is a blanket ban pro uh, and prohibition, then we will we'll try and uh, clear that up and make it as pragmatic as possible. And I think you'll see from my amendments I've done both. Happy to give way. Uh, thank you, Member, for giving way. I mean, he kind of touched on what I was going to suggest. I mean, would, would you then suggest, accept that uh, my amendment in the next group, Amendment uh, 1, would give you a compromise? Because as he says, he, uh, the Bill and Graham Simpson are kind of at opposite ends. If you banned parking except there was 1.5 metres of pavement left, would that not be a compromise? Uh, yeah, I, I, I take on board. I know we'll get to that, that grouping um, and we'll, we'll debate that because I have some amendments to that effect as well. Uh, the answer is yes, I will support your amendment, uh, Mr Mason. I think it's a sensible compromise. Um, but I, think, I still think taking that approach in itself will create problems, and I'll explain those problems when we get to that grouping, because a 1.5 metre minimum, as dictated as a national standard, will still create localised problems. And I, had, I have other amendments which will seek to address that as well. In terms of the other amendments, um, I don't want to talk about that grouping. Uh, can be a, my own amendment in this grouping, 116A, uh, refers and tries to uh, add to 116. Um, it's, it's fairly self-explanatory. But I would like to also briefly mention Mark Ruskell's amendments, because I know he's going to speak after me. Um, uh, I'm quite sympathetic to amendments 287 and 288. I think it addresses this issue of um, parking on a, a cycle 
track, and I, I believe it includes a definition of that. I tried to submit a very similar amendment and was told that Mr Roscoe had done so already. Uh, so I, I'm of a similar frame of mind if that. I'm not sure about 289 because it includes a, a verge or planting adjacent to the carriageway. The whole point of this is to try and free up pavements, and I think if there's a a sloped car uh, carriageway with a glass verge next to it, it's unlikely pram users or wheelchair users will be on that anyway. So I think that's maybe a superfluous amendment. And I'm willing to listen to 219 and 291 because I'm intrigued to see what the cause and effect of those will be and, and take a view on it perhaps afterwards. I hope that's been helpful for members. Thank you, uh, Jamie. Mark Russell, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 287 and the other amendments in the group, please? Yeah, thanks, Convener. And I'll probably just limit my comments to my own amendments that I'm, that I'm moving in this group, um, which really uh, aim to end the scourge of inconsiderate parking on three types of infrastructure that are relied on by uh, walkers and cyclists. Um, amendment 287 and 288 uh, concern dedicated cycle tracks. And uh, it does, as, as Mr Green's already alluded to, pick up on an issue that was raised by the committee uh, in its stage one report, which is that, you know, cycle tracks are often blocked by parked vehicles. And I, I certainly know from uh, when I go out cycling with my own children that a parked vehicle in the middle of a cycle track is a real hazard. It can force a cyclist into lanes of fast moving traffic or into the dangerous door zone of the parked vehicle with obvious consequences if the door is then opened by the driver or the passenger. And it doesn't take too many incidents like this, of course, to put somebody off cycling uh, for life. Um, so these amendments would ensure that cycle tracks are brought into the same regime as pavements and drop curbs that's being put forward by the government, and that inconsiderate parking can then be enforced by council wardens. Uh, amendment 289 considers the status of verges. Um, a pavement or cycle track may be separated from the carriageway by some form of verge, usually grass or other plantings. But we all know that verges can get wrecked or rutted by poor parking, while parked vehicles also obstruct the line of sight for pedestrians uh, trying to attempt a safe crossing. Now, I hope that part four of the bill implicitly includes verges in the definition of footpaths and footways. However, it could be that this is not explicit enough and so I'm proposing this amendment to hopefully bring that clarity from the Cabinet Secretary. Um, lastly, convener amendments 290 and 291 cover the school keep clear yellow zigzag lines, perhaps a matching amendment to Mr Green's uh, white zigzag line uh, amendment. Uh, brothers in arms here, brothers in arms. Um, a, a standing agenda item, I would suggest, convener, every single parent council meeting that I've ever attended um, there's always a disbelief at the fact that these striking yellow signs are only advisory and cannot be enforced. So this completely defeats their purpose, which of course is to ensure that school entrances are clear from obstructions, creating a safe environment for children and parents entering and leaving school premises. This amendment would allow parking wardens again to enforce these obvious zones. Amendment 291 makes it clear that these lines should only be enforced when they're actually needed, which of course is during the school day, not at other times, not at weekends, uh, not at school holidays. That's it. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, I'm going to call on uh, Colin Smith, followed by Sandra White. Colin. Th thank you very much, Convener. Um, uh, if I look at Graham Simpson's amendments, I mean, effectively, the amendments in this group um, attempt to remove the ban on pavement parking, uh, frankly, and replace it with an enabling power for local authorities to issue a, a pavement parking order ban that, um, for certain streets or areas. This would fundamentally undermine, I think, the aim of this section of the bill. Pavement parking is a significant hazard, particularly for people with mobility issues, wheelchairs and visual impairments, and it should be banned outright with a limited number of exemptions. I, I could only imagine the challenges we would have if we had one local authority having a ban on pavement parking and a neighbouring local authority not having a ban would we require signage um, in each area to, to, to make that clear. I think there would be huge challenges there. In terms of amendments um, 287 and 288 by Matt Ruskell adding cycleways to the, the parking pro prohibition set in this bill, I, I looked at this issue as well, and my understanding uh, and the feedback I got, because I believe that parking on cycleways should be banned, <coughs> but the feedback I received was that it was already banned under the 1984 Roads Acts, um, and effectively we shouldn't be duplicating legislation. So if that isn't the case, then I would be very supportive, <coughs> but my understanding is it is already banned. Now, there was an issue around whether or not um, that should be extended to include advisory cycleways, because I think that, that, that the ban is on mandatory cycleways. And all the feedback that I received um, from cycling groups is that they, they were reluctant to have 
a ban extended to advisory cycleways because of unintended consequences of reducing the number of advisory cycleways that, that local authorities would, would pursue. But my understanding is that mandatory um, uh, cycleways have a ban already, and hopefully the, um, the, the Cabinet Secretary can confirm that, because that would obviously determine um, whether or not this particular amendment were um, required. Um, uh, in terms of Amendment 2 Nine, uh, which clarifies that the ban covers any versions of plant adjacent to the carriage. We have no problem at all with that one. I'm not aware of that already being banned. And in terms of um, Amendment 290, um, again, I've got a lot of sympathy for this one. Um, my slight concern would be how you defined entrances uh, to schools, how wide that would be, if it's simply where they have the uh, advisory uh, zigzags at the moment, to, to, to coin a phrase, then I would certainly be supportive of that. But, um, um, I, I, I'm just thinking about the practical implications of it and what areas it actually covers, and I'm sure the Minister will cover that, but I'm very sympathetic to that, um, to that, that particular proposal. Thank you very much. Um, now, I did say Sandra White, and I'm, apparently I'm told that it should be committee members first, but Sandra, uh, I, I'll stick to my word, so if you'd like to go first, and then followed by uh, Mike Rumbles. Sandra. Um, thank, th thank you very much, Convener, and thank you, committee, for allowing me to be here today. Um, I, I, reiterate, I won't reiterate what Colin Smith has said, but I absolutely agree with every word that he has said. Uh, Graeme Simpson's amendments, as well meaning as they may be, would actually, as Colin Smith has said, you as well not having a you know, pavement parking bill. Uh, I've worked for many years on the pavement parking bill, and I thank the committee and the government as well for adopting it into the transport bill. Uh, it is indicative, I think, of society to look after all of its members. Um, we have people who are blind, people in wheelchairs, even people you know, pushing uh, you know, kids in uh, prams, elderly people, vulnerable people who can't walk on a pavement simply because their car's parked there. And you couldn't possibly put this bill forward if it is by council by council. <clears throat> and I think we've got to remember, um, and I'll speak to Graham Simpson in this particular one, there'll be an educational aspect of this as well. I've never set out to make it a punitive part of the bill. I thought it should be educated to people to let them know that basically payments are for people and they're not for parking. I'm sympathetic to John Mason had mentioned in regards to that, and there will be, as Colin Smith has said, there will be exemptions. There are ones just down the road here in Leith where we know that you couldn't possibly, you know, not have a parking on on the pavement slightly anyway. Uh, so there will be exemptions, but you couldn't possibly make it just by council. Uh, and for all the hard work that people have put into this, uh, disabled people, etc., as well, it would be a travesty if we decided that this would not be here for, for everywhere in Scotland, rather than just being by council. So I speak to Graham Simpson's one. Uh, Jamie Green, I, I take on board what Jamie Green is saying as well in regard to certain exemptions, uh, and I think they will be looked at in the bill and Matt Ruskell's uh, amendment in regard to cycle lanes in particular. I think that's something we should be looking at, but it is the law, as Colin Smith says. Uh, so I won't take up any more of your time. I would just appeal to the committee that there's been a lot of work put into this particular part of the bill, and I would ask them not to support um, Graham Simpson's amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, Mike Rumbles, followed by Richard Lyle. Thanks, Convener. Um, this is about ending the scourge of obstruction of our pavements by people who should know better um, and surely want to send a message right out there that people should not park on our pavements, obstructing people who are disabled or young mums and dads with, with prams, etc. Uh, and I think what Graham Simpson does is completely reverse that and ruins that message out there. I mean, if you take, for example, the current law, the current law says it is illegal to drive on our pavements. And yet we all see cars parked on our pavements. How did they get there? Magic? You know, they drove on it. They, they're already breaking the law. So we want to send a clear message to people that this is not acceptable. And um, I have to say, there are, there are exceptions allowed, the Minister is allowing them, in the bill for areas where it's proving very, very difficult and our local authorities are best judged to make that decision. But I think it's really important that we send a national message out do not obstruct our pavements. Now, in a way, I will in a minute, I will in a minute. In a way, I'm glad John, John was trying to get in there. I think I know what he's going to talk about because he's actually going to talk, no, he's not, right. I don't know what he's going to <laughs> I, was, I was going to say, he referred to it earlier, but in his next section, he's got an amendment on the same principle uh, of leaving a gap. 
Um, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that when we get there. But the point, the point I'm trying to make is we have to be really clear. This, we should, and if we start messing about and turning the whole process of these sections back to front, we'll be in trouble. Um, I can also confirm, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about Mark Ruskell's 287 to 88 because when I questioned the Minister and the staff in stage one, when we got this, the clear message was from his officials that this is already banned. It's already illegal. So, so I'm certainly happy to give away. Um, I, I accept that. However, the issue is that it can only be enforced by the police, and the police are rather busy, and they have limited time, and mm. therefore extending this to enable traffic wardens to be able to police oh. it would make a lot of sense, would it not? Good point, and I'd like to see um, the Minister's response to that question, and if uh, he accepts that, um, then I, I certainly will. Um, but that's, I'm just refer referring back to stage one. That was the evidence that we received. And up to, unless that changes, then um, the advice changes. And I'm, I'm a bit concerned about that. Um, OK, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Come again. OK, so uh, Mr Mason's comment will remain a surprise till he gets a chance to bring it up. Uh, I've got Richard Lyle and then Jamie Green. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, basically, my, my view, I agree with Mike Rumbles. At the end of the day, I, I believe that Pavements should be for people and ca cars should go on roads. But, you know, the, the problem is, you know, we all see it happening. We, we actually see many cars parked on pavements, uh, which are... Uh, and I know Mr Mason's going to come in and say, well, there are some pavements that are big enough to do that. But I'll refer to the, the comments by the Guide Dog Scotland. These amendments would remove the new provisions on pavement parking from the bill entirely, restore the old system where councils are only able to restrict pavement parking street by street. Now, people complain that uh, councils don't have any money, so we're going to force councils then to look at uh, each individual street and send out an official, maybe have a consultation, maybe uh, get into a situation where the system tackling the problem, pavement parking preferably would be expensive with extensive requirements for possibly signage and consultation. And basically this would leave uh, pedestrians at risk from inconsiderate pavement parking. I want to see people parked on the street. I don't want to see them parked on the pavement. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I can't uh, support uh, Mr Simpson's amendments. Thank you, Mr Lyle. Uh, Jamie Green, Jamie. Yeah, just briefly, thanks. I mean, I, 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 I hear what everyone's saying, and I think Sandra White made a, a, a very valiant point about the efforts that have gone into including this in this bill. And as I said from the beginning, there's, there's a lot of cross-party support for attacking this issue. No one for a moment is suggesting we want drivers to, uh, uh, to block the paving. But all, I think all the points that Mr Graham was trying to make, and I think others have alluded to, is that um, it's not quite as simple as moving all these cars off the pavement onto the road tomorrow. Um, it will cause accessibility issues on many, many roads, um, and, and I won't name them all. We'll, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but it, it, you know, I could be here all night because there are, we all have streets. As I said, we all have streets in our constituencies and regions where, um, if you simply move the cars from the pavement to the road, it will block the road. Um, so I appreciate what Mr. I, I would politely ask Mr. Uh, uh, Graham Simpson to. Uh, withdraw all the amendments in, in light of the, I think, the direction of travel that the committee is taking, and thank, thank him for raising the issue around the uh, practicality of actually delivering a sensible policy. Because I think when we go on to the exemption process, we will actually hopefully make some sensible decisions around the nature of what an exemption process looks like. And in the response to the point about well, this is going to create a huge workload for lo local authorities. The reality is they're going to have to go through the exemption process on a street-by-street -street basis anyway, because they're going to have to go through their local authority areas and work out which streets they want to exempt, and that by default will create a process which currently doesn't exist. So we have to put it into context in that respect. Thanks, Governor. Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, yeah. Cabinet Secretary, uh, I'd, I'd ask you to uh, make your comments now. Can I just say that once you finished your comments, and Grant Simpson has finished his comments, and we have looked at this amendment, we will be taking a pause, um, which I think some members are ready for, Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> OK. I take your hint, convener. 
Uh, the aim of the uh, pavement parking prohibition is to introduce a clear national ban on pavement parking while still enabling local authorities to consider whether to exempt certain streets in their area from that ban if the local authority considers it appropriate to do so. Ms. I will, yes. Uh, I thank Cabinet Secretary for giving way. Sorry to come in so quickly, but you did use the word exemptions, which was the word I was going to come in on, Mike Rumbles on. Do you actually think uh, councils will have exemptions because they'll be just like TROs, there'll be a hassle factor, there'll be a cost factor, they're under pressure. Do you not think there will really hardly be any exemptions? I think the likelihood of the system, the way in which we have it in the bill, the likelihood of a greater level of exemptions is lower than the approach that's been suggested by Mr Simpson, which I suspect will result in a much greater level of exemptions being provided. Uh, Mr Simpson's amendments 115 and 116 seek to remove this national prohibition on pavement parking and uh, instead enable local authorities to make pavement parking orders to prohibit pavement parking in areas that of their choosing. Amendment 118 removes the power to make uh, exemption orders uh, as these no longer need to be uh, need are needed in absence of a national prohibition. And Amendment 119 makes provision about the form and content and procedure associated with pavement parking orders. Amendment 120 makes provision about the traffic signs required where a prohibition is in place under such an order. And Amendment 121 and 143 make provision about exemptions and penalty charges, respectively. Uh, and Amendments uh, 146, 148, 150, 153, 155 and 161 make a number of technical and consequential changes. Jimmy, Green's Amendment 116A seek, uh, seeks to require a local authority to assess the effects of creating parking prohibitions before making a pavement parking order. Convener, were these amendments to be accepted, local authorities would have a discretion as to whether a pavement parking prohibition is introduced at all in their areas, rather than being a countrywide prohibition as proposed in this bill. I cannot support this fundamental change in the aim of, pavement park, the, aim of the pavement parking provisions within the bill. It would not provide a uniform national solution to this difficult problem, which this Parliament has been considering for some time. Instead, this could lead to a fragmented approach where one local authority may ban pavement parking, whereas others could choose to retain them retain, remain within the status quo. This would simply confuse motorists and frustrate pedestrians. 73% of those who responded to the government's improved parking in Scotland's consulta Scot a Scotland-wide consultation supported a ban on pavement parking on all of Scotland's roads. The figure rose to 76% when only responses from public bodies were considered, which would indicate that there is clear support for a countrywide ban or as originally proposed. Turning to amendments 727, 287, 288, 289, 290, 291, raised by Mark Rusco, the amendments in this group raise some important issues and worthy consideration, yet are unnecessary necessary due to existing statutory provision. Amendment 287 and 288 seek to include cycle tracks within the pavement parking prohibition in section 42 of the bill. Both are unnecessary because in terms of one to section 1296 of the Road Scotland Act 1984, parking a motor vehicle on a cycle track is a criminal offence. The decriminalised parking enforcement regime under the Road Traffic Act 1991 gives the Scottish Ministers the power on an application made by a local authority in Scotland to make an order designating the whole or part of that local authority area as a special parking area. Where such a designated destination order is in place, the criminal offence in relation to parking on cycle tracks ceases to apply. Instead, a civil penalty is payable. As such, there is already existing civil and criminal enforcement options in regard to parking on cycle tracks, which these amendments would cut across. Amendment 289 seeks to include verges and other, planted, uh, other planting areas adjacent to the carriageway in the pavement parking prohibition in section 42 of the bill. However, verges are more properly regarded as being part of the road itself as the verge is included in the definition of road for the purposes of the Road Traffic Regulation Act 1984. 
That Act allows the Scottish Ministers to make traffic regulation orders and temporary traffic regulation orders prohibiting parking on roads, which, as mentioned, include the verge. In terms of Section 5 and 16 of the Road Traffic Regulation Act 1984, contravention of a traffic regulation order or a temporary traffic regulation order is again a criminal offence. Additionally, the reference to other planting adjacent to the carriageway in Amendment 289 is not defined and its meaning is potentially ambiguous, to the extent that other planting is properly regarded as being a verge. The power I have already described allows for that to be prohibited under a traffic regulation order. Amendment 290 and 291 are unnecessary as provision of the Road Traffic Act 1988 and the Traffic Signs Regulation and General Directions 2016 already combine to make stopping or parking on a school entrance a criminal offence. Amendment 290 seeks to include schools etc. entrances from 8 to 8am to 6pm Monday to Friday during the school term in the definition of pavement in section 42.4 of the bill, thereby including them in the parking pavement, the pavement parking prohibition during the period specified. Amendments 90 291 defines school entrances so that the term is to be construed in accordance with Schedule 7 of the Traffic Signs Regulation and General Directions 2016. Item 10 of Part 4 of Schedule 7 of the Traffic Sign Regulation and General Directions 2016 prescribes a road marking indicating a school entrance. This can be combined with a no stopping sign which may or may not prescribe time period when it applies. The combination of the school entrance marking, road marking being in place and section 36 of the Road Traffic Act 1988, which makes an offence not to comply with traffic signs, meaning that failure to comply with the road marking indicating no stopping on a school entrance is already a criminal offence. The member wish to... Yeah, I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary for giving way on this. Um, I mean, does he have any sort of insight then as to why these yellow lines aren't actually being enforced at the moment? Because he, he describes the TSRGD and the various options that are available. Why is it that this is, as I said, a standing agenda item at every single parent council? Um, in short, ignorance. People who park in these areas are being ignorant and disregarding the safety of children and other road users. Uh, the issue that you're seeking to address is a matter of enforcement, which is an issue for the police to address. So, for example, if I look at my children's own school, uh, there was an issue there and there was additional enforcement measures undertaken uh, over a period of time in order to get the message across. Did it improve the situation? Yes, it improved the situation. But the bottom line is those who were seeking to ignore it at the time when there was no police officer there are simply being ignorant to the risk that they pose as a result. I therefore ask Graeme Simpson not to press his amendment in this group and Jimmy Green not to press amendment 116A. And I'd ask Mark Ruskell not to press amendment 287, 288, 289, 290 and, uh, or uh, 291. Uh, uh, however, if these amendments are passed, uh, pressed, I would ask the committee to reject them. Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I've Therefore, we will now call on Graham Simpson to wind up and press or withdraw his amendment, please. Thanks, uh, convener, and thanks to the committee for, for all your comments. Um, I just, uh, I, I think I need to make it clear that I'm not, not against what you're trying to achieve. I was just uh, suggesting a, a different approach, and I, um, I do take uh, what Sandra White uh, said, and you know, please be assured. I'm not. I'm not against. I'm not against what you're trying to achieve. It was just a more flexible approach, um, because I do fear that, uh, particularly uh, if, I mean, you would expect this law to be enforced. You'd hope any law is enforced. If this law is enforced, um, I, th I think councils will be queuing up at your door, cabinet secretary, to uh, have exemptions. That's what I think. But. I've heard the, uh, heard the committee's uh, comments uh, and I will withdraw every single one of these amendments, all 13 of them. I can read them all out if you wish, convener, but I'm sure you've got a list. 
No, just that one being withdrawn will allow us to move with the other one. One five and so, uh, everything else. Thank you, and, and thank you for for listening to what the discussion uh, the, the discussion that's been carried out. I'm now gratefully going to suspend the meeting. Oh, sorry, I've got to go through the formal procedures. Say, um, as Graham Simpson wants to withdraw Amendment 115, does any member of the committee wish to object? No. no one wishes to object, <laughs> therefore the amendment is withdrawn. And on that note, I'm going to suspend the meeting for seven minutes. Seven minutes. <laughs>
I reconvene this meeting of the Royal Economy and Connectivity Committee and I'd like to move on to pavement parking prohibition, exceptions including the width of vehicle intrusion on the pavement. I'd like to call Amendment 4 in the name of Jackie Bailey, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I would like to point out that if Amendment 129 is agreed, I cannot call Amendment 130, which is to be debated in a subsequent group. And Amendments 31 and sorry, 131 and 303 in this group due to preemptions. Jackie Bailey, can I ask you to move the amendment and speak to all amendments in the group, please? You can indeed, convener, and I'm very grateful for the committee's time. Um, I'm very aware that you've been um, considering amendments last week from the crack of dawn this morning and also this evening, so I hope not to detain you for any length of time. Um, a photograph has been circulated um, it really because I didn't want my lack of descriptive skills to be a barrier to this amendment, but I will attempt to describe it very clearly, convener. To describe I it will briefly indeed. for the uh, record. Amendment for, and I will limit my comments to Amendment 4, um, is very simple. It is designed to prevent cars with extended bodywork, essentially large boots, from overhanging pavements. Um, if you accept the principle that pavements should be kept clear of cars because of people with visual impairments, um, people in wheelchairs or indeed mothers with prams, um, then these larger than normal cars, which may be parked entirely legally convener, um, they are nevertheless causing an obstruction to pavements. I am conscious that some of the members of the committee may have cars <laughs> similar to this. It was pointed out to me at the break. I do not intend to pinpoint who they are. This isn't the worst example. The, 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 picture, shown, the picture shown is indeed quite a wide pavement. I'm happy to take an intervention. Well, exactly. Thank you, the member, for giving way. I mean, that is exactly the point I was going to make. I mean, she mentions cars, but I, what I've seen in my constituency, the bigger problem would be vans. Yes. And I've seen vans where the distance between the rear wheel and the rear of the van can actually cover the whole pavement. Absolutely. Would you agree with that? Yes, I, I entirely agree. You know, there are vans, there are mini <coughs> trucks, there are trucks that I think would probably fit better in Texas than in downtown Dumbarton. But, but it's a range of vehicles that actually would be keeping within the law because they're not parking, their wheels aren't on the pavements, but the overhang is so significant that actually it causes quite a bad obstruction. Um, the, the, I haven't given you the worst example in the photograph, but this was an issue raised with me by a local resident in Dumbarton, hence the amendment here today. And I hope the Cabinet Secretary might find his way to even agreeing it, convener. Uh, on that note, we'll move on to the next <laughs> amendment from John Mason, which is amendment number one, and I ask you to speak to that amendment and other amendments in the group. John. Uh, thank you, convener. My sole amendment, and it happens to be number one, and I only intend to speak about it, uh, although I think the reason I put this amendment in is similar uh, to what Graeme Simpson has been speaking about and I think Jamie Green uh, has been speaking about as well, which is that, frankly, we just do not have enough space in our towns uh, for what we would like to do. And we would all ideally like a full pavement, we'd like cycle lanes, we'd like parking space, we'd like enough room on the roads, and there just is not enough space for all of these things. And my aim with this amendment was to provoke a discussion and to seek some kind of compromise or halfway house um, and uh, to see if we could get some balance. Uh, I mean, even just this week, I had people at my surgery in a new estate where the roads tend to be quite narrow uh, and they were complaining that a, road wa a car was two wheels on the pavement, two wheels on the road, and even then the bin lorry couldn't get past on the road. Uh, so if that is the case, putting the car fully on the road uh, makes things even worse. So the aim of this was to provoke uh, a discussion. Um, I do fear, though, that I I'm not sure any of the solutions that any of us are putting forward are really going to solve this, because I think the point the Cabinet Secretary made recently, that uh, it's all very well having rules if they're not enforced, uh, does, uh, I'm afraid, uh, come to the key issue. And I, I continue to be concerned that the exemptions uh, are not likely to happen and that councils will tend to um, avoid exemptions. Now, in order to find out what the councils thought, I wrote to all 32 councillors, uh, councils, and uh, I'm very grateful that 21 of them actually replied. And some of them were quite brief, but I had some extremely good ones. And, for example, Dundee uh, was very thorough 
in some of the points it made. They said there's not enough road space to accommodate vehicles. Um, enforcement uh, is limited in certain areas. And um, the, they take the point, and a lot of the council said this, that they, they got the point of why you would have a 1.5 metre uh, exemption, but that does create problems. It's too uh, simplistic in many ways. Um, for example, they say it would, could restrict the council's ability on how to manage parking in its own areas. They feel they should have more uh, discretion. And in fact, in some cases, they currently allow vehicles to park fully on the pavement um, if there is sufficient room. And they might want to continue to do that. But on other areas, the 1.5 metres would not be enough, uh, especially if it was a town centre where there's a lot of extra uh, pedestrians and all the rest of it. And then they raise questions like, where are these vehicles expected to park? So, all in all, uh, I put this forward to create a discussion. Uh, I think others have taken part in that. Um, I kind of suspect that this, a simple 1.5 metres is, is not the answer, um, but I wanted to have the opportunity to raise these points anyway. Thank you. Thank you, John. I now call on Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 292 and other amendments in the group. Jamie. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I do have a, a lot of amendments in this group. Um, it's just the way they've been grouped together. I hope members will, will bear with me as I try and get through them. I think the ones that are consequential are technical amendments. I'll skip over and try and get to the substantive points of the ones that I think deserve debate. Um, because this whole section looks at the issue of exemptions and exceptions. And I think it's an important uh, part of the pavement parking bit of the bill. Um, I, I'll start with... Um, <coughs> The, uh, first of all, I think the point that John Mason made, there, we, we've looked at different approaches with this. A number of members have submitted amendments around, uh, very similar amendments around this issue about having a minimum pavement width. And I think it's, a, I think it's an admirable uh, intention. I'm quite keen to hear what the Cabinet Secretary has to say about this or what the government's view on this, because the idea of putting in either a default minimum, which they're, they're, thereafter allows some form of on-pavement parking, is, I think is how Mr Mason's amendment reads, um, provides a form of compromise and sensibility to the no parking at all uh, provision. However, if the 1.5 metre, uh, the application of 1.5 metre is a nationally dictated standard that local authorities must adhere to as part of the exemption making process, then I think by default that will create some of the problems that I think members have concerns about. So that's why I'm not, it's not that I'm un, not supportive of having a 1.5 metre minimum, minimum pavement width, it's just that if we put it down in the way that it's presented in the bill, then it will create, uh, in effect, a, a rules-based system that means no exemption can be granted unless there's 1.5 metres. Now, there are lots of examples where the pavement may be 1.45 metres or thereabouts, or nearly 1.5 metres, but the local authority still feels that it, sh it would like to allow some form of pavement parking, uh, two-wheel pavement parking, to, as alluded to, there's nowhere else to put the cars. And that is a genuine issue. Now, I, can I say to Ms. Mason, I wasn't aware of the, of the work he'd done right into local authorities, that's a great piece of work because actually they're the people that have to deliver this. They're the people that have to enforce this. They're the people that have to go around their local authority areas and work out where the exemptions should be and do what's right for their communities. And I think the problem with the nationally decided exemption rule of 1.5 metres is that we are telling them what that exemption process should look and feel like. And I want to give them the flexibility to make localised decisions based on the roads that they know best, their local roads, knowing the circumstances, it's not just about the width of the pavement, or indeed some of my men, it's about the width of the road. It's more complex than that. It's about what else is around those streets, what other parking provisions are available, where, where are the cars being displaced to if they're banned from parking on the pavement. And that, I think, is a real issue that we haven't given enough time and credence to. And I think I'd love to read some of the responses from the local authorities. And I hope that the government will work with Mr Mason and the committee to come up with a solution, because I don't think 1.5 metre is the solution, but I think there is a solution out there that we can find, and I hope that the bill team will reflect on that. Um, briefly on 292, uh, this amendment, um, uh, if I just get my bearings, uh, removes uh, subsection 2, uh, which basically says that a footway may not be specified in an exemption unless 
uh, it has the characteristics specified by ministers. And I guess my, po my problem with that is, that, again, it's the ministers who will dictate the characteristics of what uh, a, a pavement should look like before an exemption order should be given. My thought from day one on this is that the local authorities should make that decision, not the Scottish ministers laying down guidelines that they have to take into account before making that decision. So that's why I want to remove that. Uh, Amendment 293. Um, I contemplated flipping it on its head. So rather than having a minimum pavement width as, as the first piece of guidance, you then have a minimum road width, as is often the case uh, in other pieces of regulation. And I've looked at many of the government's other uh, regulations around road widths uh, and planning uh, guidance. Um, and originally I had a number in there in this amendment, but I, we spoke to the legislation team. And I think having a prescriptive number as to preserving a minimum road width to allow the safe passage of emergency vehicles was not a wise idea because every road is different. Um, and indeed there are different rules attached to different types of roads as well. So that wasn't sensible. So I've, I've, I have uh, changed this amendment slightly to basically just says that the prohibition cannot apply, in other words, the cars cannot be moved from the pavement to the road, if that creates a scenario where the road is not wide enough to get an emergency vehicle down. Because ultimately that's what this is about. It's about access through, I would say, normal access through our roads. And if the cars have moved from the pavement to the road, and that's made that road so narrow that you cannot get an emergency vehicle through it, then I don't think that, that the prohibition should apply to those roads. And that's what this amendment seeks to do hopefully. Uh, I'm sure we'll get some feedback on it. So it's not going to solve the problem of what we do about where the cars go, but it is going to at least give local authorities a bit more flexibility on where the prohibition applies or doesn't when it comes to exemptions. Uh, some of the other amendments around that are uh, technical. There is an amendment there on signage, but I take on board the conversation we had earlier. I'd be keen to hear in uh, Amendment 296 where the government is going to propose that the exemption signage is standardised throughout the country, or each local authority will have to devise its own format for that. We, the conversation behind the local emission zones is very similar, and I take on board the, the feedback that was given that there will be government-issued uh, um, guidance on signage, so probably uh, not move that one. Um, and there are some other uh, amendments around that as well. Um, I think another important one is 298. Uh, I'm sorry there are lots of amendments in this group, but it is, is what it is. Amendment 298. Um, adds a, an additional uh, uh, power to local authorities that says such other purposes as a local authority may prescribe. Uh, this is to do with exceptions. Exemptions and exceptions are two different things. And I've got a number of amendments that look at different scenarios where I think an exception should apply. Um, and I hope you'll give these some thought. One is, the first one is that the local authority may prescribe the circumstances that an exception uh, should apply. I would like to think the local authorities when using this power, um, will do, we'll do so in a sensible manner, uh, that they won't create exceptions simply to get around the legislation, but they will make, um, I think, sensible decisions about what scenarios they may wish to give an exception relevant to their local authority. It's simply a, a, an enabling power in that respect. Um, Amendment 300, um, I had a lot of consultation, as many of us did, with stakeholders around uh, not just pavement parking, but double parking prohibitions. Um, the idea that there should be uh, adequate, um, I would say, leeway given to people dropping off people who are vulnerable, disabled, or uh, have impaired mobility. Um, as it stands, uh, I know we'll get onto the 20 minute rule later in the debate, but um, I, I would like to see on the face of the bill that the prohibition does not apply if the vehicle has been used to pick up or drop off someone who's disabled, vulnerable or has impaired mobility. Now, again, I'm happy for the wording to be altered as to make it as, as competent as possible. But I think it's an important point to make. You need to give drivers the ability to pick up um, elderly relatives, to drop off people with disabilities. It may take some time. They may have to double park. I think we have to accept that that's normal. They're not trying to be difficult. Um, I, I can't see anywhere else in the bill that allows them to do that. And I think that's why I would like that exception um, on the face of the bill. The other one is around taxis. Um, again, used for the collection and picking up of people. Um, and it's to give them a reasonable amount of time to do so in their normal course of business. It doesn't mean the taxi driver can double park and go and do shopping. It has to be during the course um, of picking up and dropping off passengers. And again, I'd like that on the face of the bill. Um, 
there are other minor amendments I won't go into too much detail on um, around uh, whether an officer is wearing a uniform or not. Um, there is one odd one um, around uh, emergency uh, in an emergency situation where an exception is applied. Um, and the bill says for no, no longer than necessary for that purpose. Um, I think it's quite hard to predetermine what, how long an emergency situation would take. It could take all night. It could take days to resolve a situation where someone's had to abandon their car to respond to an emergency situation. So I'm, I'm just trying to take that, that bit out, but leave it in elsewhere uh, in the bill. Um, and I think the final one is of, of, of importance is 308. And I think this gets perhaps to the nub of it, where I'm trying to get to an end point um, where local authorities determine whether the prohibition applies or not. And really what I wanted to do was give local authorities the final say and the final power when it comes to both exemptions and exceptions. I think they're best placed to take a view, either in the long term in the case of exemptions or in the short term, as the officers uh, at the scene uh, dictate. Let's give them the power to make sensible decisions uh, on the circumstances they're faced with and not preempt uh, that by setting down the ground rules. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I won't talk to any of the other amendments in this group. I appreciate it's been a long grouping. Um, but I think the exemptions and exception uh, angle of this bill is, is really important we get this right. Thank you very much, Jamie. Uh, now I call on Colin Smith to speak to Amendment 117 and any other amendments in the group. Colin. Thank you, convener. I'll start with Amendment um, 4 um, from Jackie Bailey, which I think is a very welcome addition to the bill, uh, parking in a way that causes a vehicle to overhang uh, onto a pavement. Um, in effect, has exactly the same effect for pedestrians as a car parked on the pavement, uh, and therefore I think it's common sense that we should um, uh, include this in any, any ban. Um, in terms of um, Amendment 117, uh, in my name, uh, this clarifies that exemption orders should not be issued in instances where a car parked partially on the pavement is likely to leave less than 1.5 metres. So um, the 1.5 metre figure is there, but I think it does almost the opposite of what uh, John Mason is looking to do. I recognise the need for exemption orders to allow local authorities to exempt streets from the ban when it is absolutely necessary. However, put simply, I don't think exemptions should allow drivers to obstruct the pavement. 1.5 metres is widely agreed as a reasonable minimum width needed for pedestrians, including those with prams and those in wheelchairs, and this amendment would ensure that this would have to be left under any exemption orders. If cars are allowed to continue to obstruct pavements, and ultimately this ban is not delivering on its purpose, I think we need to be absolutely clear about this on the face of the bill. These amendments, in effect, look at the pavement as something for pedestrians, eh, therefore the focus is on them, as opposed to where the cars may go, which is frankly eh, a matter for the road, not the pavement. Amendments 124, 126, 128, 134 uh, and 138 by Mike R Rumbles, I think like, likewise, all clarify that the various exemptions set out in the bill do not apply in instances where less than 1.5 metres is left, and I fully support these amendments. Uh, amendment 1. 29 in my name would remove the exemption for deliveries uh, and amendment 139 would require the Scottish Government to bring forward regulations serving a, a similar purpose. Uh, members will recall that at stage one major concerns were raised by the committee about the workability of this particular exemption in the bill. And given the risk that this will end up acting as a loophole, uh, I have concerns about actually including this within the face of, of the bill. However, I do recognise the need for some form of exemption along these lines for deliver deliveries. For this reason, I think either this or preferably an alternative should be set out in regulations so that if there are unintended consequences, it can be more easily changed than it would be if it was on the face of the bill. And I think that was a point. Uh, yeah, I'll take that on the engineer. Sorry, I, to um, uh, say that in my haste to try and speed things up, uh, Amendment um, 303 takes out the 20-minute um, exemption, uh, sorry, the 20-minute um, cap, uh, which I see Colin Smith supports. Um, would he uh, agree with me that that's perhaps <coughs> one way, but not the only way, of, of coming up to a sensible solution on the loading and unloading of goods? Because there were, there were concerns, I'm sure others will speak to those, about creating uh, these 20-minute um, drop-off rules, um, which, would, which could even encourage uh, people to, to double a pavement park. Um, and that if we remove that, it doesn't solve the problem. We still need to find a sensible solution to how long you give uh, vans and businesses to load and unload. I think Jim, you made a valid point, and it's covered in his Amendment 303. Um, 
which removes effectively the 20 minute time frame from the face of the bill. I think this time frame was considered um, by members when we discussed this as unenforceable and, and stakeholders raised concerns that it would be taken to mean everyone has 20 minutes rather than encouraging people to take as little time as possible. So I very much support um, Amendment 303 in Jamie Green's um, name. Um, unfortunately, what that means is I've forgotten exactly where I was in my previous comments. Um, <laughs> not at all. It just means I'll probably repeat what I've just said, sadly, could be that. Um, well, it was to support what, um, what I think uh, Mike Rumbles was, was saying. Um, I think Amendments 139 and 139B, sorry, 139A and 139B uh, to my own amendment make a few suggestions how an alternative produced in regulations could be tightened up compared to the drafting in the original bill. Amendment 139A requires a vehicle not to be left unintended. This does not mean the driver has to be uh, in or even next to the vehicle at all times, but simply within the vicinity. In effect, this means if the driver is away from the vehicle while in the process of making a delivery, this would be acceptable, for example, at the top of a, 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 a building where he's delivering a particular item. But, however, if they're away for an extended period of time at a completely different location from where they were delivering, then this would not be acceptable. Now, members may have concerns about the language here, but this language is used in a similar context in the Greater London Council General Powers <coughs> Act of 1974 so it is a recognised way forward. Amendment 139B clarifies that this exemption should not allow vehicles to obstruct a pavement. Um, uh, 1.5 metres was widely agreed as the minimum amount of space that should be left on a pavement, and this amendment would clarify this. Um, amendments 304 and 305 make these same additions to the existing text in the bill, but they would only be moved if the particular section of the bill was not removed. So if my previous amendments were not carried, effectively removing this section of the bill, what I'm suggesting here is an alternative, which is to amend that section of the bill. So it would be very much my preference to remove this section entirely and put it in regulations. But if the committee does not support this, I believe these amendments will help to strengthen that particular um, section of the bill. Amendment 139 by Mike Rumbles, like Amendment 305 in my name, also looks to prevent exemption orders being issued where they will leave less than 1.5 metres. If the committee do choose to keep this section in place and amend it, I'm happy to support either 131 or 305. I think that's Thank you, period. Colin. Um, Mike Rumbles, can I ask you to speak to Amendment uh, 124 and any other amendments you wish to in the group, please? You can, convener. Um, sensible compromise, that's what my eight amendments are all about. Um, the most important amendment of these is at 131, which cuts to the quick. Let me explain. In evidence, members will remember that uh, there have to be exemptions to this uh, parking prohibitions, and a lot of the subparagraphs are absolutely <coughs> right and proper that they are in there. I think the controversy was on paragraph 6, when we took in evidence the fact that um, uh, they don't apply where a motor vehicle is in the course of business being used for the purpose of delivering goods to or collecting goods from any promises or being loaded or unloaded, etc. And then it went on to say, <coughs> and you can do that for a period of 20 minutes. So I put down two amendments to which I have now withdrawn them and only to find that Colin Smith has put the identical amendment down at 129 and then Jamie Green did the identical amendment at 303. So I would ask them later on not to move those amendments because I withdrew mine. And the reason I withdrew mine was I'm very pleased to say that in discussions leading up to, to, uh, to um, stage two, I found the minister very amenable to uh, logic and evidence and coming up with, with, a, with a compromise that I'm certainly happy with because at the end of the day, it's this issue of 1.5 metres, and that is the solution. It is, a, it, it is a generally accepted situation. What we want to avoid, what we want to avoid, is blocking the pavement for pavement users, the disabled, young mums and dads, elderly mums and dads, with or grandparents with, with, with children in prams, etc. Anybody that needs to get through. So when I saw the bill as it was originally intended, I thought, well this draws a coach and horses through what we intend. And the minister recognised that, so I, I'll give due credit to the minister. And we, ha we have, between us, come up with these amendments. They are in my name, but it is a joint effort. And I thank him for that. So really, the solution to this whole issue is just to vote for my amendments. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, 
I think the answer to that, Mr Rumbles, is we'll see when we get to the vote. Rachel Hamilton, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 302 and, and any other amendments in yeah. the group? Thank you, Convener. And may I urge members not to uh, double park or park on uh, the pavement tonight when they pick up the fish and chips. Um, but uh, my amendment is along my theme uh, of tonight, which is supporting community transport for providers, and it does also complement Jamie Green's amendment uh, of number 300. Um, and I completely agree that inconsiderate parking must be tackled. However, if the prohib prohibition of pavement parking includes community transport providers, this will have a detrimental effect on vulnerable people. And many members tonight have spoken about those uh, people who are affected. But for specialist reasons, uh, parking um, on the pavement may assist with the collection or dropping off of wheelchair users, for example. And that is why I urge the committee to support my amendment to allow community transport providers to park on the pavement when it is reasonable to do so in relation... Can I finish the sentence? In relation to the process of collecting and dropping off. Thank you. Yes, I, know, th I thank you for giving way. I, I know the point she makes about uh, you know, wheelchairs, disabled people, that kind of thing, and we did get evidence on that at the committee. Now, that wouldn't just apply to community transport, would it? It would also apply to taxis, relatives, and a few other people. Would that be handled as well? Uh, I do believe that Jamie Green's um, amendment could take care of that, but I am not 100%. Um, this is specifically about community transport in this instance. Mr Mason. That's me. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I have Sandra White, who's indicated she wants to speak, and I'm going to add something in, in this section. So, Sandra White. Thank, thank you very much, Convener. I think the first sentence that John Mason said, uh, where are these vehicles supposed to go? Uh, I would be saying, where are the people supposed to go? Because that's the whole process and, uh, of this particular uh, part of this bill. But I do accept from Jamie Green and others and John Mason in regards to exceptions or you have to look at that. I think it's something that we certainly do have to look at. I do um, agree entirely with Mike Rumble's amendments. I think they're sensible. I'm not too sure about the 1.5 and pavements, because some pa pavements aren't even 1.5. So perhaps, as Jamie Green had mentioned, it may be too prescriptive. But I think we do have to look very carefully at exemptions. But the reason at the very beginning when we said this has got to be Scotland-wide, but there will be exemptions that local councils will make, that they, they, will, they will be the best people to do that. Uh, and I did uh, give an example of the colony houses, as you might call it, in Edinburgh, where it is practically impossible to park. But the fact of the matter is, in, in my constituency, some places have three and four cars. Uh, they park on the pavement, and it doesn't just inhibit people being able to walk on the pavement, it also inhibits you know, emergency services. I have some places in my area where emergency services can't even get down the street because of the amount of cars that are parked on pavements uh, and overflowing. So it's a double whammy for certain areas there. Uh, but I think, on, on the whole, I think what you were saying was sensible. I think we do have to look at the exemptions, whatever it may be. I don't know if the 1.5 is, is correct. Uh, and Rachel Hamilton's um, amendment, uh, I, I would worry that um, you give some people a tiny bit and they take a mile, basically, in that respect. They could be sitting on a pavement for quite a long time. Yes. What we're trying to say is the 1.5 is to leave the gap. If it isn't a 1.5 metre gap, they shouldn't be parking there. So, but I, what I do worry about, and I'm not saying I think what you're saying about the amendments is absolutely correct, but would it be too prescriptive uh, for other areas? But local councils will make up their mind if the pavements are too small. You can't have a 1.5 gap. So I completely understand that, and I completely support the amendments that Mike Ruggles has made. I, get, I take your point entirely. Um, however, what is reasonable in terms of the process of collecting and dropping off when um, you are uh, dis, dis embarking with a wheelchair and, and then you know, reversing that process. I mean, we do have to be very uh, aware that, that it mm -hmm. is a very difficult process um, for some individuals, particularly community transport providers who are you know, uh, doing that as a service. Well, certainly the community transport providers in my own area, you have two people who take the wheelchair off. I've never seen a community transport in my area which parts on the pavement. 
basically somebody is off and they take the wheelchair off with the person. So I've never seen that happen in, in, in my particular area, uh, which is pretty busy with lots of uh, various uh, old folks' homes, etc. as other people are too. But what I'm just saying is, really, this is, for me and for lots of people out there, this is about allowing people to have the right to walk on the pavements, uh, regardless. And I think vehicles... Uh, people have become so fond of their cars, they would park in their living room if they got a chance to do it. Uh, and I think, as I said at the very beginning, uh, when Graeme Simpson was there, it's not about punitive measures, it's about educating people. Some of these people that we talk about have driveways, but they park their car right in front, we're going on to drop curbs, they park it in front of drop curbs even. Basically. So it's about educating people the fact that if you, if you don't have a car and you're disabled, whatever it may be, you have as much right as they have to be able to walk about where you live as they want to drive about. And I think that we have to look at very carefully uh, that um, we don't basically say the car is king, which has always been said. We have to think about the people who are walking on the pavements or attempting to walk on the pavements. But I take on Jamie Green's point and John Mason's point in regards to looking at the exemptions. I think that's one of the important parts, but I'm sure that would be covered uh, by local authorities at that stage. Thank you. Um, okay, I think it, it, it's now my brief opportunity. I just want to talk to amendment number four from Jackie Bailey. Uh, and she helpfully provided a picture showing the overhang of a vehicle on a pavement. And it's something that I've been particularly conscious of, and I particularly support the principle of ensuring that pavement width is 1.5 metres. The problem is that's not always achievable uh, with, in some cases, where not unlike Edinburgh, where bins are on, on, the, on the pavement and cause obstructions. And certainly, if you care to go down Wellington Street in, in Edinburgh, not far from this par uh, parliament, you will see hedges that overgrow the edge of the pavement by probably half a metre as well, further squeezing uh, people into uh, the, the, where cars are parked on the edge. And the other point I would make is when you're cycling in, one of the nice things about where cars are parked at the moment is that you don't have to go over the, the speed humps, which forces you often into the route of, of cars. So I think I have genuine concerns, not with the aspiration of what Jackie Bailey wants to achieve, because I think the asp aspiration is right. I think the enforcement will be difficult, and I think the unintended consequences uh, for other people who are misusing the pavement will, will, will reflect purely on the cars. So I would just ask that to be, to, to be borne in mind. Um, and personally, I, th I think that the restriction that, that Amendment 4 brings in um, doesn't actually place the obligation on the other people who are misusing the pavement to, to keep it clear to the one point five metres that I think we're all striving to achieve. So I will not be in a position to support that. Um, and I'm now, if no other member wishes to speak, uh, going to call on the Cabinet Secretary, who I'm reliably informed will be giving us a short uh, 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 response to these amendments. Cabinet Secretary. So, Convener, as you'll appreciate, with some 33 amendments in this uh, particular group, there's a considerable amount for me to say. However, I will be speaking for less than those who have been moving their amendments here this evening uh, and covering these issues. Uh, but I will avoid taking interventions to try and help to speed up the process if members uh, would uh, keep that in mind. Uh, amendment 4, in the name of Jackie Bailey, seeks to extend the pavement parking ban to parked vehicles overhanging pavements by more than 20 centimetres. While I acknowledge the, reason for, the reasoning for this amendment, in my view, it goes too far. It's not necessarily the case that overhanging by 20 centimetres will give rise to access or safety issues, or indeed that it will be periodically avoidable, uh, it, it practically avoidable uh, for motorists. Options are available to local authorities to limit overhanging, such as wheel stops in parking bays. And where overhanging clearly does cause an obstruction and is therefore a safety or access issue, that will constitute an offence under section 592 and 1292 of the Road Scotland Act 1984 and regulation 103 of the Road Vehicle Construction and Use Regulations 1986. Moving on to payment widths. 
uh, a restriction of 1.5 metres of pavement space to enable free movement for pedestrians whilst parking under an exemption is something that the committee recommended in its stage one report. However, John Mason's amendment one would go further, enabling all motorists to park on the pavement provided they leave 1.5 metres for pedestrian access. Convener, the intention of this part of the bill is to introduce a national consistently enforced ban on pavement parking, subject to local discretion on exemptions. In my view, local authorities are best placed to decide where roads should be exempt from the prohibition, taking account of carriageway and pavement width, road construction and access issues. Amendment 1 would fundamentally undermine this approach. Jamie Green's Amendment 292 and Consequential Amendment 295 seek to broaden the discretion afforded to local authorities in making exemption orders by moving the requirement, removing the requirement that streets to be exempt possess characteristics set out in ministerial direction, which are currently being developed in conjunction with local authorities. While local authority discretion over exemptions is important, a degree of national consistency will ensure that the policy aims of this bill are not undermined through excessive use of exemptions, and I therefore cannot support Amendment 292. Amendment 295 removes the definition of carriageway from Section 43 and appears consequential on Amendment 292, which seeks to remove Section 43.2, where the term carriageway is used. But I wonder if this is a mistake because the term used appears in this Amendment 293. The direction setting out uh, the characteristics will require uh, a, a, a Characteristics will include the consideration of carriageway and pavement width measure, measurements so as to ensure that if there is a street through which the passage of emergency vehicles could be hindered by the introduction of the pavement parking prohibition, that street can be included in the local authority's exemption order. I therefore do not consider there is a need for Jamie Green's Amendment 292, uh, 293, which seeks to put on the face of the bill a duty for local authorities to consider exemptions to allow the passage of emergency vehicles. Colin Smith's Amendment 117 seeks to prevent local authorities from exempting uh, from the parking ban if vehicles are parked on those pavements uh, would leave less than 1.5 metres for pedestrians to pass. In my view, this rigid approach does not give local authorities enough flexibility in relation, for example, historic streets with narrow footways and carriageways where a minimum 1.5 metres could not be achieved without hindering the passage of vehicles on the carriageway. Amendment 294 from Jamie Green seeks to remove the requirement that exemptions orders may not be subject to conditions. While I again acknowledge the importance of local authority discretion and ability to place an, unspecific, an unspecified variety of conditions on exemptions is likely to undermine the consistency and simplicity of these prohibitions and therefore enforcement, which I consider to be a key to its effectiveness. Jamie Green's Amendment 296 and Consequential Amendment 297 seek to impose on Scottish ministers a requirement to prescribe in regulations the form of the traffic signs to be used in connection with exemption orders under Section 43. Convener, both these amendments are unnecessary because Road Traffic Regulation Act 1984 at Section 64 1 and 2 already gives Scottish ministers a regulation-making power to prescribe traffic signs, including traffic signs for exemption orders under Section 43. My officials are working on the design of these signs in order that suitable amendments to the Traffic Sign Regulations and General Directions 2016 will be brought, before, brought forward to prescribe these signs. Section 47.3 of the Bill contains an exhaustive list of exemptions for the parking prohibition where the undesirable parking where, where this undesirable parking is necessary in the course of the performing in the course of performing a number of public services. In my view, the integrity of the prohibition relies on this list being strictly limited and nationally consistent. I therefore cannot support Jamie Green's Amendment 298 as it seeks to give local authorities the ability to add unlimited further exemptions to the list. The effect of Colin Smith's Amendment 299 and 304 would be that vehicles which are left unattended cannot take advantage 
of the exemption in section 47.3 or 6. In many circumstances, it would be impossible for the driver of a vehicle who these exceptions are targeted at, such as a delivery driver or a postal worker, to undertake their duties if they are not to be permitted to leave their vehicle unattended, even for a brief period. In my view, this restriction is completely impractical and I therefore cannot support it. Turning now to Mike Rumble's amendments in this group, these take account of the committee's concerns about obstructing pavements when parking under the exceptions is in section 47.3. Obstructive or dangerous parking can and does cause serious problems for everyone and puts the safety of pedestrians and other motorists in jeopardy. These amendments ensure that there is a reasonable and practical balance between the need of those, needs of those parked in the majority of circumstances otherwise exempt under except under section 47 and the needs and safety of pedestrians to put in they put in place a clear and consistent requirement that the majority of exceptions under section 47 apply only if 1.5 metres of pavement is left for pedestrian passage. This should facilitate effective enforcement and tackle the issue of obstruction. I therefore fully support the amendments in this group brought forward by Mike Rumbles. Colin Smith's Amendment 305 aims to achieve a similar outcome in relation to the delivery and loading exemptions in section 47.6. While I support the principle behind this amendment, I consider that Mike Rumble's amendments tackle the issue more effectively and do so consistently across the majority of exceptions in section 47. I therefore ask Colin Smith not to press amendment 305. I cannot, however, support the principle uh, behind Colin Smith's amendment 129, 139, 139A and 1. 39B, which seeks to remove the delivery and loading exceptions for, from the face of the bill and instead give ministers the power to set out in regulation a similar exception. Convener, I have listened to the views of the committee and a range of stakeholders in relation to this exception. It is important to note the views of the road haulage and delivery industries as part of this dialogue and the need to strike a balance to allow businesses in Scotland to continue to operate whilst protecting the accessibility of our pavements. As I have already mentioned, the amendments lodged by Mike Rumbles would improve the provisions as introduced and would safeguard the accessibility of pavements. I am not convinced that there is any provision that ministers could make in regulations to improve matters further than is already set out on the face of the bill here. Finally, on the delivery and loading exceptions, uh, Jimmy Green's Amendment 303 would remove the 20-minute maximum wait period for this exception. The effect would be that a vehicle parked on a pavement or double parked under this exception could remain parked for longer than 20, a 20-minute 20 period. Uh, it could it be shown that it was necessary to do so for the delivery collection or loading or unloading to take place. Convener, the exception at 47.6 of the bill offers a limited relaxation of the prohibition for short-term parking only. It was never intended to allow for longer-term stays. If parking for extended periods is required, deliveries, or loading vehicles, they should seek alternative parking on uh, alternatives to parking on the pavement or double parking. I have serious concerns that allowing parking for deliveries for an unlimited and unspecified period, which would be the legal effect of Amendment 303, would fundamentally undermine the intentions underlying this exemption and the pavement and double parking prohibitions more generally. Jimmy Green's Amendment 300 would allow anyone to park on a pavement for an undefined time period whilst they collect or drop off someone who is disabled, vulnerable or has impaired mobility. As the amendment does not provide any definition of the terms vulnerable or impaired mobility, this exception is ambiguous and could be very broadly construed and give rise to uncertainty. On that basis, I cannot support the amendments as drafted. I do, however, acknowledge the importance of ensuring that the access needs of disabled people require to be taken into account in the operation of these prohibitions, and I would therefore commit to considering in advance of stage three whether any further amendments may usefully be made to safeguard these needs. Jamie Green's Amendment 101 and Rachel Hamilton's Amendment 202 would exempt taxi drivers 
or private hire vehicle drivers and community bus services, respectively, from the pavement parking and double parking prohibition. I am not persuaded that, uh, that, that, that it is needed for taxis or private hire uh, drivers, or they differ significantly from the needs of anyone else who needs to collect or drop off on a street where the prohibitions are in force. Accepting this amendment would create an unjustified and potentially very broad new exemption and undermines the consistent application of the prohibition. I have uh, some well, more sympathy uh, with Rachel Hamilton's amendment in relation to community buses. However, I cannot support an amendment that would permit these large vehicles to park on pavements, in particular, give, in particular given the damage they may cause to the pavement in doing so and the safety and access problems that may arise. I am, however, happy to consider before stage three whether community buses should be permitted to double park in limited circumstances. Amendment 306 by Jamie Green seeks to remove the requirement for a police constable to be in uniform when granting permission for a parking prohibition to be disapplied. I am concerned that removing the requirement for a police constable to be in uniform could create confusion and uncertainty, uncertainty amongst road users as to how a police constable can be identified and on what authority any direction is being applied. I therefore cannot support this amendment. Convener, Amendment 307 from Jamie Green seeks to remove the requirement for persons parking on the pavement for the purposes of saving a life or responding to another similar emergency to be so parked for no longer than is necessary for that purpose. While I, uh, whilst I acknowledge the need for there to be flexibility in the provisions to enable drivers who are responding to life-threatening emergencies, there is a need for that to be uh, for uh, proportionality in how even an exception in this kind is applied. Jamie Green's amendment would effectively allow a person who has who had parked on a pavement or double parked in order to respond to a threat to life or to remain. Uh, so part indefinitely after the threat had been addressed. I consider that, it is to, that I consider that to go a bit too far and against the grain of these prohibitions, and I cannot support Amendment 307. Amendment 308 by Jamie Green seeks to provide powers for local authority officers to allow pavement and double parking in circumstances where they deem it to be reasonable. While reasonable local authority discretion is a thread running through the whole of Part 4 of the Bill, consistency and certainty are fundamental to effective enforcement and to gain public trust in the fairness of that enforcement. Allowing discretionary powers for local authority enforcement officers to permit pavement and double parking in undefined circumstances would be far too subjective an approach and, in my view, would threaten to seriously undermine the policy intent of a national ban and public acceptance of it. Finally, convener Jamie Green's Amendment 309 seeks to require the Scottish ministers to consult with local authorities and other persons as they consider appropriate when modifying any of the exceptions in section 47. As this committee will be aware, the Scottish ministers ensure that all local authorities and interested, interested groups have been consulted via the Parking Standards Group, which was set up during the consultation process for the parking provisions in this bill. That group is continuing to meet regularly to consider the parking standards guidance, and the Scottish Government is fully committed to that process. I am not persuaded that a statutory consultation duty would add anything to that well-established process. As I mentioned at the outset, convener, the many issues raised by the amendments in this group are important, and I am grateful to members for their careful work in bringing them forward and for their contribution to this debate. But for all of the reasons I have set out, I can only support the amendments in this group lodged by Mike Rumbles. If those are pressed to the vote, I would urge the committee to support them too, and I would invite other members not to press their amendments in this group. If those amendments are pressed, I would ask the committee to vote against them. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can I ask Jackie Bailey to wind up, please, and press or withdraw your amendment? Um, you'll be pleased to know I don't intend to respond to every <coughs> amendment in the group. I think that would test the Committee's patience somewhat. Um, I note the Cabinet Secretary's comments in relation to Amendment 4. Um, he seemed to suggest, if I picked him up right, that the provisions already exist and therefore there's no need for my amendment. That being the case, could I practically make a suggestion um, that he is likely to be providing guidance to local authorities and the 
police about pavement parking, and if we, he would include in that guidance reference to the question of overparking, then I would be content to not press that amendment. And I think that's a practical solution. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes my comments, convener. And, sorry, you're not. I'm not pressing. Okay. So, uh, as Jackie Bailey wishes to withdraw her amendment uh, four. Can I ask if any member objects? No. No member objects, so therefore the amendment is uh, withdrawn. I call amendment one in the name of John Mason, already debated with amendment four. John Mason to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. Uh, amendment 116 in the name of Graham Simpson is not uh, moved either. Therefore, that takes us on to amendment uh, 287. Uh, therefore, the question is that amendment... Sorry. Yes. Sorry, who's moved that? Oh, sorry, as to ask if Amendment 287 is to be moved uh, by Mark Ruskell. I think you're going to do that, Mr Finney. Uh, Mark Ruskell doesn't wish to uh, move Amendments 287, 288 and 289. Thank you. Okay. Therefore, the uh, question is, uh, I call Amendment 290 in the name of Mark Ruskell, already debated with Amendment 287. Moved or not moved, Mr Finney? Moved, convener. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 290 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. Therefore, there's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes, four, six votes against. Therefore, Amendment 290 is, is not agreed. I call Amendment 291 in the name of Mark Russell, already debated with Amendment 287. Uh, Mr Finney, moved or not moved? It moved, convener. The, the question is then that Amendment 291 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's division. Are there, uh, those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, six votes against, therefore Amendment 291 is not agreed. The question is that Section 42 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I therefore uh, call Amendment 292 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 4. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. OK, I call Amendment uh, 293 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 4. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 117 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 4. Colin Smith to move or not move? I'll move, convener. The question is that Amendment 117 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are nine votes against, therefore Amendment 117 is not agreed. I call the Amendment 294 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 4. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 295 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 4. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. Uh, amendment 118 is, uh, is not moved, and therefore I ask if, section, if we agree section 43, are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, Amendment 119 is not, uh, is not moved. I therefore uh, ask the question, is uh, section 44 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 296 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 4. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 297 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 4. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move. I therefore call Amendment 120 in the name of Graham Simpson, which he is not moving. Uh, therefore, the question is that Section 45 be agreed. The Section that 46 be agreed. Um, now, uh, Cap... Uh, yes, just to be clear, Amendment 121 in the name of Graham Simpson is not moved. Now, Cabinet Secretary, just please, I wondered if, without being rude, I could ask you, is the, the, you are the only one speaking on this group, uh, I believe, unless members wish to speak, which they may well do. Could you give me an indication of how long you think it would be to put your points on this? About three minutes. 
Okay, uh, then I am going to press on and I'm going to call Amendment 122 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I would point out that Amendment 129, already debated in previous group, has agreed to, if it's agreed, I cannot call Amendment 130. Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to move Amendment 122 and speak to the other members in the group? Convener, uh, this, uh, this committee stage one report expressed concern uh, that the issue of parking across drop curbs at pedestrian and other recognised crossing places was not included in the bill when it was first introduced uh, uh, to Parliament. Evidence from stakeholders highlighted that parking at drop curbs is perceived to be a significant barrier to accessibility in many streets. As you will know, I consider inconsiderate and obstructive parking a serious problem for everyone, which puts the safety of pedestrian and other users in jeopardy. As explained at stage one, we have received powers via the Scotland Act 2016 to legislate uh, on parking at drop curbs. However, uh, this is need to be, we need to be clear that the impact of introducing such a ban in urban areas and to explore whether this could be introduced via secondary legislation. We have listened to the views of the committee, parliamentarians and stakeholders who have highlighted the wider impact this issue is having on vulnerable road users as well as the local economy. Amendment 141 prohibits the parking of vehicles on uh, dropped footways. This encompasses both what the, where the footway has been dropped and where the carriageway has been raised, where the purpose of either is to assist pedestrians or cycles, uh, cycle, uh, bicycles across the carriageway. Uh, Amendment 142 it makes it clear that this new parking prohibition does not apply to curbs that have been dropped for the purposes of accessing driveways or garages, both residential and commercial. The ban will also not apply where the vehicle has been parked for the purposes of saving a life or responding to a similar emergency. Amendment 144, 147, 149, 151, 154 and 156 make provision for the implementation and enforcement of the new prohibition to match the existing prohibition on pavement parking and double parking already in the Bill. This includes enabling local authorities to issue penalty charge notices when motorists have con contravened the ban. Finally, the remaining amendments in this group all flow from the new prohibition. Amendments 122, 123, 125, 127, 130, 132, 135, 136 and 137 are to make it clear that the exception to the parking prohibition outlined in section 47 of the bill only apply to the pavement parking prohibition and the double parking prohibition, not to the new prohibition. Amendment 157 and 156 respectively provide a definition of drop footway parking prohibition for the purposes of this part of the bill. I therefore ask the committee to support all of the amendments in this group and I move amendment 122. Thank you. Uh, does any other member wish to speak in this group? Cabinet Secretary, uh, I'm not going to ask you to wind up. I'm going to move straight on on the basis that you will have said all that you want to say. Um, and just say to members, there are, are a series of votes now, and once we have completed these votes, that is where we'll be stopping. I am going to go through them um, carefully to make sure that I get them right as we come to the end of a very long day. So the first question is that Amendment 122 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I therefore call Amendment 123 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 122. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Moved. OK, the question is that Amendment 123 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I therefore call Amendment 124 in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 4. Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 124 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I therefore call uh, Amendment 125 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 123. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 125 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment one, sorry, 298 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 4. Jamie Green to move or not move? Bear with me. <laughs> not moved. Thank you. I therefore call Amendment 299 of, in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 4. Colin Smith to move or not move? I'll move it. Yeah. The, <laughs> the question is that Amendment 299 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed, therefore there is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Sorry. It, 
Sorry, sorry. Can I, can I ask you, as, as we get closer to the end of the day, committee members, could I ask you to raise your hand clearly and with purpose to avoid confusion? So those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. There is one vote for, ten votes against. Therefore, Amendment 299 is not agreed. I call, I call Amendment 126 in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 4. Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Move. I, the question is, therefore, that Amendment 126 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 127 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 122. Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to move it formally, please? Moved. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 127 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 300 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with uh, Amendment 4. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved, can you? Thank you. I therefore call Amendment 301 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 4. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move, convener. Amendment 302 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is not moved. I therefore call Amendment 128 in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 4. Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Move. Thank you. Uh, the question, therefore, is that Amendment 128 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 129 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 4. Colin Smith to move or not move? Um, despite Mike Rumble's being a passionate advocate of this throughout the entire process, um, I don't want to... Uh, I will not move it, uh, and I'm sure he'll be disappointed. He won't have an opportunity to follow through on his previous support. But I therefore call amendment, sorry, the amendment is not moved. I therefore call amendment 130 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with amendment 122. Cabinet Secretary to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that amendment 130 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, therefore, I call amendment 131 in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with amendment 4. Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question, therefore, is amendment 131 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, I call Amendment 303 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 4. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. The question, therefore, Amendment 303 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Yep. Sorry, I'm not sure whose list you're looking at. OK, those against, please raise their hands. <laughs> Thank you. There are four votes for. There are seven votes against. Therefore, Amendment 303 is not agreed. Uh, I call Amendment 304 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 4. Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, not move. I therefore call Amendment 305 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 4. Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, not move. I therefore call Amendment 132 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 122. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Moved. The question, therefore, is Amendment 132 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 133 in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 4. Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Moved. The question is, therefore, that Amendment 133 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, I call Amendment 134 in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 4. Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Moved. The question, therefore, is Amendment 134 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 135 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 122. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Moved. I th the question, therefore, is Amendment 135 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, I call Amendment 306 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 4. Jamie Green, move or not move? Sorry, I've lost the will to live. Um, <laughs> No, not no, moved. no, hold on, hold on, <laughs> not hold moved. on, seriously. <laughs> in, in, in fairness, we have moved quite quickly, so I'm going to ask a question again. Uh, Jamie Green to move or not move Amendment 306. Please. Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 136 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 122. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Moved. Uh, therefore, the question is, uh, Amendment 136 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 307 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 4. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move. I therefore call Amendment 137 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 122. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Moved. The question, therefore, is Amendment 137 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, I call Amendment 138 in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 4. Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Moved. The question, therefore, is Amendment 138 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, I call Amendment 139 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 4. Colin Smith Smith to move or yeah, not move? Not, not move, can be enough. Thank you. Um, yep. So, I... Hold on. I therefore call Amendment 140 in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 4. Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Move. The question, therefore, is Amendment 140 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. Yeah. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 308 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 4. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I therefore call Amendment 309 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 4. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that Section 47 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're nearly there, Committee Members. I ask, therefore call Amendment 141 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 122, Cabinet Secretary, to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 141 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 142 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 122. Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to move it formally, please? Moved. Thank you. The question, there be, for therefore, is that Amendment 142 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I therefore call... No, I'm not going to call Amendment 143 because it's not moved. Uh, I call Amendment 144 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 122. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Moved. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 144 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed, and therefore... The good news is this is as far as we can go. Hold on, let me make sure I get this entirely right. This is as far as we can go today. We will continue next week. I would like to thank everyone, uh, committee members and those people who have been attending today for taking part in these two sessions. Amendments to the remaining sections of the bill can still be lodged. Amendments to provisions after section... Um, Sorry, I'm just going to confirm that. OK, I'm just going to say the remaining sections um, of, of Section 48 can be lodged up until noon tomorrow. And, and that concludes today's committee business. And I now... Oh, hold on. Sorry. Sorry, can I just confirm that the... Deadline for amendments is this up, up to up to and including 48, and the rest of the bill, and in all sections, the deadline is tomorrow noon, or is that? Oh, it's just to say. The remaining sections of section 48, and then Okay, it's the it's the remaining uh, sections of of sorry the remaining sections of section 48 and amendments to provisions after section 58 and up to the end, and end of section 68, i.e. part 5, should be lodged by noon tomorrow. OK? Exactly. Does that clarify it? Uh, I'm trying to work, uh, establish whether the, any amendments to the workplace parking levy amendments, if the deadline is tomorrow yes. noon. Yes. yes. Thank you. OK. Thank you very much, everyone. It's been a long session, and I thank you for your, for your attention. Sorry? I, hold on. I, I now close, close the meeting. Sorry. Can I ask what time we're starting next week? Uh, yes, I'm going to reflect with the clerks and speak with the deputy convener. And once we have come up with a time that allows us to complete our amendments, I will come back to you, Mr Lyle.